Good morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome everyone to the exciting session, our virtual dialogue on Indigenous women's perspective on healthcare and wellness. Um, I'm Mary Ellen Terpella Fonder Akikwe, and I'm joining this Zoom webinar today from Wasanich People's Territory. I'd like to acknowledge the territory and the Wasanich people for having the privilege of um, living and working today on their unceded and treaty territory. I'm extremely happy we're having people continuing to come into the webinar. So um, we want to make sure everyone gets a chance to come in and join this amazing event today. Today's event is uh, brought to you by the UBC Residential School History and Dialogue Center, as well as um, our partnership with the UBC Learning Circle, the Center for Excellence in Indigenous Health, and the First Nations House of Learning at the University of British Columbia. Um, to get us started in uh, a good way today, I would like to invite uh, Musqueam Elder Doris Fox to give us a welcome and a territorial acknowledgement. Over to you, Doris. Thank you very much, Mary Ellen. I swile the meat of Kotkwilam, eat of Kamasquam, and Satolis Fox. Good morning and welcome, everyone. Um, I raise my hands in gratitude to you for coming in a spirit of love, honor, friendship, and respect. I'd like to welcome you into my home territory, the territory of the Musqueam people. We raise our hands in gratitude to you. We ask that humbly that you have an open heart and an open mind during this session, that whatever you learn from this session, from this beautiful gathering, that you take it and you share the knowledge that you've learned. As my great grandfather Manette always said, knowledge is ours to share. It is not ours to keep. So it's so important to keep passing on what you learn to those that you work with, to those in your community and in your circles, your family, your friends. We raise our hands in gratitude to Great Spirit for bringing us together in such a good way this beautiful morning. And I know that some people might say that's a little crazy because it's raining again, but we must remember that it's up to us to give our Mother Earth the love that she needs to help her heal so that she can work together with Father Sky and stop the rains from coming. The more love we give her, the better it is for us as well because she takes care of us no matter what we do to her. So we raise our hands in gratitude, Great Spirit, for helping us to love our Mother Earth in that beautiful way that she loves us. We welcome you into this session and hope you have a good day. Thank you. Thank you, Elder Doris, for that territorial welcome. And uh, again, very excited to have this event today. And I see more people continue to join us, but we're going to get started. So in the, um, in the course of our time together today, we're gonna have some frank discussion and conversation about issues of racism, harm and stereotyping of indigenous women. I just wanna urge everyone to take care to utilize resources that are available should you need them, including mental health resources that are available for both um, participants and panelists. And I appreciate this can be quite triggering, but it is important to have a safe space and also to have a frank discussion. Uh, today is the one year anniversary of the release of a report in British Columbia called In Plain Sight, which was a report that was commissioned by the Minister of Health in British Columbia to look at anti-Indigenous racism in BC's healthcare system. And many of the amazing uh, women that are here today participated in that report. It was, although I released it and uh, was asked to prepare this report and review, it was a group effort. And not surprisingly to many people listening, involved a number of, of Indigenous women working together in a team 
both officially and unofficially to service and advance these matters. And I just really want to recognize and acknowledge that leadership and say how valuable it is that we're many of the, those pe people who participate in that team are here today. That report examined and demonstrated that for Indigenous uh, people, sort of more than any other population examined, and especially for Indigenous women, Indigenous women are bearing far too much of the burden of racism in healthcare and in fact in other sectors. The report on racism did look at um, health services. We actually looked at education services where children and families are having difficulties navigating supports for their children, particularly where they have learning needs and the child welfare system and other intersecting systems. But our focus was on health care. A commonality um, that I just wanted to point to uh, at the beginning of our session across all of our Indigenous belief systems is a fundamental understanding that Indigenous health and Indigenous women's health is family health, community health, and nation health. And it's also a reflection of cultural health. The cultural well-being of the nation is frequently reflected in how effectively women can seek and get the services and supports they need um, and that their families need. Colonialism, as we know, brought toxic patriarchy into our systems. And for sure, at the Indian Residential School History and Dialogue Center, we're dealing with the ongoing need to do truth telling and to examine the impact of these genocidal policies like residential schools on our people, our nations, and our families. This toxic patriarchy is something that undermines the, not just the role of Indigenous women, but the value of Indigenous women's voices, and also has tended to ostracize and marginalize Indigenous women. And even though we have a stellar panel today and, and we have participants just of extraordinary qualifications and you're gonna see their qualifications in the chat because if I actually went through all of our qualifications in our entire session would be spent doing that because the learning and the knowledge that is here is amazing. But toxic patriarchy often limits indigenous women's participation in healthcare. Over the past year in British Columbia, that has changed a bit. And some of the people you're gonna hear from have now taken up more identified leadership roles in part because In Plain Sight highlighted the need for indigenous women to be more strongly in, a, in a leadership roles. But this toxic patriarchy that is part of um, uh, colonialism and that has been introduced in Canada and of course in the US, we'll hear some, some of our um, Indigenous women colleagues from the US. It's undermined the role and value of women, but it also continues to expose women to misogyny, to risk and to injustice. And that's something that we have to address. But today we're also gonna talk about the efforts among Indigenous women and, and nations, Indigenous nations, particularly in British Columbia, to reclaim the strength, teachings, and rightful place of Indigenous women in health leadership in all forms. And this is the antidote to continuing structural racism, uh, colonialism, and misogyny. Indigenous women continue to step forward as caregivers, coordinators of care, health leaders, and healthcare providers. And in that role and dimension are bringing a different kind of practice and a different kind of leadership and it's a practice and leadership that has not always been welcome, but is desperately needed to respond to the important issues of improving health outcomes, improving the navigation of the healthcare system, including fairness, and ensuring that for particularly First Nations and Métis people in British Columbia, that it is a safe and effective system. Without Indigenous women prominently in leadership, supporting, building, and assisting in the delivery of services, there will not be a safe system. No matter how much training, no matter how much onboarding is provided to people in the system, it won't be safe unless Indigenous women are prominently woven into the leadership of that system. So today we're going to have three panels and a moderated question and answer period. And our panels and um, our questions and our answers and our exploration in this dialogue today will really focus on two key questions. 
The first question is how can Indigenous women lead improvements in Indigenous women's health and well being? And the second question is how do we assure that the health and well being of Indigenous women in health leadership is upheld and protected? How do we support the women who do lead and how do we strengthen that opportunity for leadership? There are going to be some calls for action. This is a very action oriented event. There's going to be some calls for disruptive change. And there's also going to be some celebrating and upholding those women who are ensuring that this is the safe um, space for Indigenous women and healthcare for Indigenous women is actually improved and changed. So we invite you to place any comments or questions you have in the chat by using the Q&A function. Um, a member of the Residential School History and Dialogue Center team, Shannon Robinson, she's going to be managing the chat. If we can't get back to you during the session, we apologize because we have so many part participants, but we'll try to collect your questions and answers, and we will get back to you if there's some follow-up and some resources. We'll also try to put some resources in the chat so you can see um, some of the materials that we may be referring to if you're having difficulty finding them. Um, I'd also like now to introduce Serene Squawkin, who's the manager of the UBC Learning Circle. And UBC Learning Circle are graciously presenting the event on their platform. And um, Serene can offer a few comments in terms of the operations of the next couple of hours together. Over to you, Serene. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to the UBC Learning Circle. I'm the new UBC Learning Circle manager. My name is Serene Squawkin. I'm from the Okanagan Nation. Um, I'm Seal Okanagan on my mother's side and Hickory Apache uh, and Belgian on my father's side. Uh, I'd just like to um, let you know who's joining us um, working behind the scenes. Cynthia Lung um, is our UBC Learning Circle production coordinator. And um, as um, Mary Ellen introduced Shannon, Shannon's from the Residential School and History and Dialogue Center as the Education Programming Strategist. So we'll be working behind the scenes. This event is in collaboration with the, in the Residential School and Dialogue Center, the UBC Learning Circle, Center of Excellence for Indigenous Health, uh, First Nations House of Learning. And I would like to acknowledge our funders for the event. Thank you, FNHA and UBC Anti-Racism for your support for this event. And thank you, Mary Ellen. I'll hand it thank back. you. Thank you, Serene. Thank you for all of your support and for hosting us on the platform as well. And also for acknowledging the supporters um, for us being able to put on this event. Um, I also really want to express gratitude to everyone in the chat who's identifying the territory that you're participating in our virtual circle today. I just saw someone from Mi'kmaq territory in Newfoundland, and it just really warms my heart to think that um, there is a community of practice and action that's national in scope. Obviously, we're going to have um, national and international speakers today, but keep telling us where you're from and what territory you're on, because um, in this time of Zoom and virtual gatherings, it's so important to be grounded in cyberspace as we talk together and to just know that um, as we walk on all of our di different territories today, we're going to be carrying this knowledge forward together. So thank you. Um, I want to introduce uh, my co-moderator for today, Dr. Margaret Moss. She's my colleague at the University of British Columbia. Um, she's uh, more than a colleague. She's a close ally with um, myself and the UBC Residential School History and Dialogue Center. She's actually just transitioning from one role to another, or I, I'm not sure if that's the right way to say it. Maybe she's just doing too many jobs and she starts a new job <laughs> tomorrow. She's currently the director of the First Nations House of Learning at UBC. And tomorrow she steps into the role of interim associate vice president, equity and inclusion, which is um, a very natural and brilliant transition and a great benefit to UBC. She's also an associate professor of nursing. She served as a key advisor um, to and a colleague that worked closely with us and our team on the in-plane site review. And uh, you'll see her um, complete CV in the chat. But I can just say that as an Indigenous woman that has been in health leadership for decades, 
decades. Her wisdom, knowledge, and experience is invaluable, certainly to guide and direct myself and the team that did the work in, on In Plain Sight, uh, but also her leadership going forward to ensure that women are respected and heard in spaces like the University of British Columbia, that it's safe for Indigenous women, but fundamentally that we have to lead the work on the transformation of health care to be safe for Indigenous women. So over to you, my friend, Margaret. It's lovely to see you. Uh, thank you so much, Mary Ellen. That's wonderful of you to say those things. But I do see also that uh, Elder Price has joined us. So I'd like to just step back for one minute and let Elder Price um, help with her or help us with her protocol and teachings for us. And then I'll join. Warmest thanks, Margaret. And internet, Wi-Fi, hard to get on. So thank you, got on just as you were speaking, my dear sister, Elder Doris, so honored to sit in the circle with you and all of our beautiful women and our leaders and all of our people today. So I'll, I'll share a thank you and a welcome as well. Thank you so much and a blessing. Thank you so much, everyone. Paichka, Paichka, CM, CIA. Greetings and welcome, everyone. As Co Salish Matriarch and Elder, I wish to give a very warm thank you to all my relatives on the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the Tsleil for welcoming me to live in the unceded lands of my relatives, Musqueam, here in Richmond for 41 years now. As Co Salish Matriarch and Elder, I wish to give each and every one a very warm welcome who live, work, and play, give and receive service, teach and learn on our unceded, ancestral, and occupied lands of my relatives, Musqueam, Squamish, Sliwitu, always honoring and following in the beautiful mentoring footsteps of my beautiful mentor elders, Elder Vince Stogan from Musqueam, Elder Bob George from the Sliwitu, following in their teachings, of always sharing a blessing and a prayer whenever we come together. Thank you for listening, everyone. Aichka, Aichka Osiam, Osiam. We call upon you, Creator, to bring your many, many blessings down upon our very, very wide virtual circle of Zoom here today. We ask, Creator, that you bless our minds, our hearts, our bodies, our spirits. So when we think our thoughts, they are good, positive, and respectful. When we speak our words, they are good, positive, and respectful. We call upon you, Creator, to bless the people who prepare the food, bless the food and drink we put in to nourish our bodies on our journeys to wellness and strength. We give you kind thanks each and every day, Creator, for your special blessings and protection you bring down upon all the beautiful people who are working so very hard in so many ways during this pandemic for all illnesses, for the safe delivery of our grandchildren and great-grandchildren, and especially for the ongoing opioid crisis. Continue to bless and protect them and their families, Creator. We kindly and respectfully ask you, Creator, to bring peace, comfort, and love down upon all our relatives right across Turtle Island who have reopened wounds and are grieving all over again over the media releases of this last year. We also ask Creator for special blessings of protection, safety, peace and comfort down upon all our beautiful families who have experienced the rains and the floods, who have lost their homes, their livelihood, their, their livestock, their animals. We bring love and comfort down upon all of them, Creator. And we kindly and respectfully ask you, Creator, to wrap each and every one of us and all of our loved ones in your warmest blanket of protection as we all continue on this part of the journey of our lives together. Help us each to keep safe in our travels, both near and far, Creator. And we always give you many, many thanks, Creator, as we ask you to bring all of your blessings down upon all the ones that are hurting, all the ones that are grieving, all the ones that are hungry, all the ones without homes, and especially, Creator, all the ones that are hurting, all the ones that are Paichka, Paichka Osiam, Osiam. Thank you so much, everyone. 
Osiam, and I pass those sacred vows back over to you, Margaret. Osiam, Osiam. Thank you, uh, Elder and Dr. <laughs> Roberta Price, so much for that. Uh, really appreciate it. So I will be moderating panel one. It'll be about an hour. People have about 10 minutes ish each. And so I'll just give you a quick blurb about what this is. Uh, in this panel, we will seek to provide necessary context about the intersections of colonialism, racism, and sexism impacting on indigenous women's health. So this includes identifying strategies employed in other jurisdictions to support indigenous women's health and wellness how the health system performs for Indigenous women in BC and the status of Indigenous women's health and wellness in BC and associated recommendations. So we want to better understand what are the strengths and gifts to draw upon and what are the system failures that must be addressed for Indigenous women in BC. And so to examine these questions, we have five Indigenous women presenters. I will introduce the first one on my list. Just uh, briefly, again, you can find uh, their full bios elsewhere. I think they were going to be in the chat or something to that effect. Um, so uh, let me get to my first one. And I'm so sorry if I say anybody's uh, traditional name or area wrong. I'm, I'm still learning, especially in BC. Oh, I'm, I am calling in from Musqueam territory as well. But my background is from my territory at Fort Berthold in uh, North Dakota. In, um, the three affiliated tribes of North Dakota. So I will give it a whirl. <laughs> so first we have Dr. Danielle Bain Smith, sorry if I said that wrong, uh, who has been working to support indigenous health in the office of the provincial health officer since 2015, working alongside uh, Bonnie Henry. So she is a Cho Dene, big animal people of the Fort Nelson First Nation in BC, with French Canadian Métis roots in the Red River Valley. Since getting her doctor of medicine from McMaster University and completing residencies at Ottawa and Manitoba, Dr. Ben Smith's career has spanned the country and the globe. And she has much more, but I we would rather hear from, from her herself. So over to you. Oh, wonderful. Thank you so much. Selo Siet Nezu Ne Kandeta. Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you, Margaret, for that introduction. And uh, thank you so much to Elder Doris and to Elder Dr. Roberta Price for your words and all the opening and for being invited to participate um, this morning. I know we've been given uh, a brief time to share. So Cynthia, if it's possible to have my slides up, I will um, endeavor to keep my comments brief. Thank you. Um, so actually we can go right to the next slide as well. Thank you, Cynthia. Um, when I think of wellness, I think about this beautiful artwork and quote from Christy Belcourt and it reads, the plants are teachers. They are connected to each other and all other spiritual beings through the sacredness of life. When I remember who I am, a human being connected to all of life, I remember also that I am loved by the spirit world and our ancestors. And when I remember this, I remember to respect even the smallest of things. And so as I was listening to Elder Doris's opening and talking about uh, Mother Earth, uh, it just resonated for me with this image, this quote, and really acknowledging that this is who we are and these are our deepest roots of wellness. And so I believe that being healthy and well means being in harmony and balance in mind, body, and spirit, and with all of our relations. I believe that humility, gratitude, respect, ceremony, land, language, laughter, and food are all good medicines. And I also believe that self-determination is the key determinant of health. And so in terms of establishing the context for decolonizing women's wellness, I further believe that structural systemic Canadian colonial practices and policies undermine and interfere with our ability 
to fully be ourselves, to be healthy, vibrant, and self-determining because they are rooted, um, deeply rooted in ideologies of white supremacy and patriarchy and misogyny. Uh, next slide, please, Cynthia. So this image, um, if anybody has um, seen me speak before, I always bring this image up um, and it's created by Cree artist Kent Monkman and it's called The Daddies and it's a recreation of a Robert Harris painting that was commissioned by Ottawa to celebrate the Charlottetown conference. So the original painting is called The Fathers of Confederation. And the story that I understand is that when Kent Monkman saw the original painting, he was struck by an empty footstool that was in the foreground. And he took the opportunity to occupy that empty footstool, footstool um, with this androgynous alter ego um, figure, Miss Chief Eagle Testicle. And it was an opportunity to illuminate the absence and exclusion of Indigenous people and women um, at this very pivotal moment in history. And if, you know, very simply put, we were excluded because of ep epistemological differences and the belief that, um, widely held belief that Western European ways of knowing and being were superior to that of our ancestors. So, Another way we could say this is that there was an ideology of white supremacy. And so if we want to um, decolonize wellness, I think it's really helpful, at least for me, to ground myself in those two truths. The truth that um, of who we are that's captured in Christy Belcourt's image and quote, and then also the truth that this bedrock um, that governs our day-to-day -day lives of structures, systems, and policies are very much rooted in these ideologies of white supremacy. Um, and so uh, next slide, please, Cynthia. So when I'm grounded in those truths, um, I'm a person who likes action. I like to see things change and transform. And so I think about the how. And so when I think about how do we decolonize women's wellness, um, I think about this image, which is from Lisa Boyven, who's a Dene bioethicist. Um, and this image is entitled Sharing Bioethics. And it really has become an anchor and a touchstone for me because when I look at Lisa's image, I'm reminded that uh, there's a need to acknowledge and see multiple worldviews. There's a need to de-emphasize the mainstream settler worldview and a need to activate that ethical space where those circles interact. Um, and so in our office, the Office of the Provincial Health Officer here in BC, we've begun some work with Dr. Kate Youngblood, who's a settler epidemiologist, who's a health systems impact fellow with us over the next two years, um, to really turn our gaze fulsomely on that mainstream circle and to root out the ways in which white supremacy is deeply embedded in the way that we work. Um, next slide, please, Cynthia. So we believe that decolonizing women's wellness, um, we believe that reconciliation requires being trustworthy, creating cultural safety, and making things right with the original inhabitants of these territories. So our efforts to earn and maintain the trust of Indigenous peoples, as well as communities of color in BC, are going to center on over the next few years on unlearning and undoing systemic white supremacy and racism that we've inherited from the settler colonial origins of our institutions. So this is uh, an exciting piece of work, I think, uh, when I think about all of the foundational directions that we've been given from um, our relatives, uh, and through the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples, the TRC, the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women's and Girls Report uh, in plain sight 
Um, we've been told very clearly the changes that need to happen. Um, and we all belong to institutions, whether it be governments or post-secondary institutions that have committed to upholding those directives. And so um, this is really exciting for us to participate today and be able to learn from my esteemed uh, sisters and aunties in this circle. And um, I will leave my remarks there to hear from the other incredible panelists. Thank you so much. Those are just stunning um, visuals to bring to this <clears throat> discussion. I think that's just wonderful. And I'd just like to remind people that they can place any comments or questions in the chat and uh, using the Q&A function. And we'll try our best to answer uh, during the session, but probably more likely um, Time permitting, at the end of today's session, we will hopefully have time for more questions. So we'll move along in the um, queue here as soon as I find my area. So Dr. Margot Greenwood is next. Academic leader of the National Collaborating Center for Indigenous Health, is an Indigenous scholar of pre-ancestry with years of experience focused on the health and well-being of Indigenous children, families, and communities. She is also Vice President of Indigenous Health for the Northern Health Authority in British Columbia and Professor in both the First Nations Studies and Education Programs at the University of Northern British Columbia. So Dr. Greenwood. Thank you. Um, Tansi and good morning, everybody. I'm calling in from the unceded territories of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe peoples, and I'm grateful to, uh, for my opportunity to visit here um, today. I also want to thank the elders for opening our day in a good way. Um, which, um, I'm really excited to be participating in this first birthday of the In Plain Sight report. I think it's a landmark. Um, study and an opportunity for us to have this dialogue. So thank you uh, to the organizers for inviting me. I was asked to speak about intersectionality, <laughs> determinants of health and indigenous people. And um, so the presentation, uh, the few slides that I have really looks at how these kinds of approaches can help us to understand the complex realities in which indigenous women's health um, and well-being is situated. So next slide, please. This slide really shows um, a definition um, and really looks at um, intersectionality. It's really a, an approach or a lens in which we can look at health and we begin to see all of the overlapping factors and dimensions um, as um, Danielle was showing in her picture, all of the connections, not one thing happens, but many, many things um, impact our lives as women and our well being. Um, and really, the um, intersectionality is really meant to get at those power differentials that um, people have already spoke of on this panel. Um, already and um, really to look at that and consider that then in actions that we may take in the future. Next slide, please. This slide is about the social determinants of health and what, what do we mean by that? And really it is about all those things that can impact our lives. So our early childhood, how were we raised? How were we socialized? Our education? Um, uh, the employment that we do, our gender, and that's what today is all about. Um, did we have enough food to eat? Our housing, all of those things. And I think you all know this. I think this really resonates and well with our whole concept of holistic well being. Um, all of these are elements and far more. Next slide, please. The social determinants of health were really taken out of a, uh, the Ottawa Charter, Charter in a 2009 report, Closing the Gap by Sir Michael Marmot. But what wasn't in that report were other determinants of health, determinants that went beyond the social to include spirit and land. Um, this 
this list is specific to Indigenous peoples. And it looks to the present and it looks to the past. So what you have there is a listing of that, the colonial experience. And we've heard some of that already. And I know we're going to hear more of that. The experience of residential schools, of self-determination, of language and culture, um, indigeneity, where we live, our geography, our spirituality, our kinship. And that's probably, this isn't a comprehensive list, but those are unique, I think, to Indigenous peoples in this country. Next slide, please. This slide really looked at the Implate Cider report itself. And I chose a couple of examples because I really do think that these examples, and I'm not going to read them out for you, I'm gonna let you do that, but I really think they show the intersection of racism, of gender bias, of um, colonization, of classism. And we could probably add more to this list, but these really exemplify some of the experiences that our people have in, um, in the healthcare system. And so I chose these because here is the intersection in these realities in the health system that were articulated in the Plain Sight Report. So we can see that it isn't just one factor, that there's many factors that underlie actions um, and understandings. To me, I think that is the, the most, one of the most puzzling things is to understand in this way. And then how do we move from this? It's the action part that becomes so important. Next slide, please. This slide, um, sometimes when I'm doing this kind of work, we think about all of these different determinants, all of these different factors that impact our lives. What do, we, what do we experience at our individual level or at the practice level if we were talking healthcare systems? What are all of the systemic determinants, the policies, the systems that we live in that impact our lives? They may not impact us directly, but they absolutely impact our lives. And, and sometimes these systems reach in and do impact us directly in some ways. And then, of course, the bigger structural determinants on the outside of that circle is things like legislation, agreements, colonialism, racism, all of those big superstructures, if you will, impact our lives at the individual level. They impact through the systems, they impact right down to the individuals. And I think about oftentimes when I'm thinking about this work, it is so overwhelming. And I think about our spheres of influence and what sphere of influence do we have? Where can I make change? Am I working at the practice level where I can, can educate and share my thinking with individuals? How can I use my professional organizations to create that change? If I'm working at the policy level, how can I ensure that policies aren't um, a party to sexism or racism? How can I, a classism, any of those, how can I make sure that those policies and those structures that are in those systems are the best that they can be? And how do I provide um, the information that our leaders need? How do I hold e women up? How do I hold each other? How do we hold each other up? to create those large advocacy pieces that need to happen in order to shift those larger superstructures. I asked myself those questions, um, especially because I knew that our focus today was, was on actions. It's on the 24 recommendations that are in the In Plain Sight. And I just wanted to share, um, as, I, as I close here, I just wanted to share a couple of quotes with you um, that came to mind. And I'm going to take us out um, into a broader sense here. One of the elders I was just uh, in a meeting with last night, and as I think about action, 
She said this, understanding how we and others perceive the world through our social and cultural understandings is critical to creating the change that we want to see. So understanding how each of us has come to the place that we have come helps us to understand what we need to do to create that change. That's what I took away from her words. And she was really talking about the socialization of people, the socialization of others who have come to these lands, how have they been socialized? And what we're asking in the kind of change we're asking, we're asking for societal change. We're asking for individual change. We're asking for system change. And we're asking for huge structural change and justice. And when I came to that place, I was reminded of yet another quote, and it comes from the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples. It comes from the commissioners. And it said, Canada is a test case for a grand notion. The notion that dissimilar peoples can share lands, resources, power, and dreams while respecting and sustaining their differences. This is the story of Canada, a story of many peoples trying and failing, trying and failing again to live in peace and harmony. I think about that quote a lot. And I think about people who have come to Turtle Island. I think about that, come to this place. And how is it um, that they've been socialized? What stories did they hear? I think too, that there can be no peace and harmony without justice. And this includes Indigenous women taking back their rightful place and their leadership in these lands. I'll go to the next slide, please. And I will leave you with two things. One is that when I thought about this, I have three sons. I am hopeful that their generation looks at justice and change differently and starts from a different place than I have. I also have a grandbaby, a granddaughter, and I am hopeful for justice in her time and her place. And my call to action is to action the in plain sight recommendations. I think we're already going down that road and this is a beginning. This is a new day. And I guess if I personally had to choose one, I would put my energy into education at multiple levels. So miigwech, and I would love to have more conversations about that with all of you. Hi, hi. Thank you, Dr. Greenwood. You're singing my song in most of those areas, I, uh, structural determinants of health and so forth, systemic change is where I live most of the time. And I'm also struck with how similar um, the histories and outcomes and thoughts that got us here are on both sides of the border. So um, that's a nice segue into Chief Malerba, who's next. Um, so she is the first female chief in the Mohegan tribe's modern history. And for those of you who don't know, that's in Connecticut in the US. Uh, she follows in the footsteps of her mother, former tribal counselor, Loretta Robert, and her great grandfather, Chief Matagua, sorry <laughs> uh, for any mispronunciations. She served as chairwoman of the tribal council and executive director of health and human services for the tribe. And prior to her role at Mohegan, she spent 23 years in the field of nursing, ultimately director of cardiology and pulmonary services. She earned a DNP, doctor of nursing practice at Yale, was a Jonas Scholar and a master's degree in public administration and bachelor of science in nursing. And I'll leave it there so she has time to talk. Go ahead, uh, Chief Malerba. 
Well, Kachaptontumawish, I thank you to Dr. Margaret Moss. You were such a wonderful mentor uh, to me at Yale, and I appreciate the time that we spent together and the time that you continue on um, with this journey. And I would like to say also, Kachaptontumawish, thank you to elders Fox and Price for your wonderful openings. I greet you from Uncasville, Connecticut, which is the village of Chief Uncas, and I'm happy to be with you today. Uh, I am not an academician and I am not a clinician these days. And uh, the Tiwi Sangsquama time. What's a hash? My name is Chief Many Hearts, Lynn Malerba. And the reason my name is Many Hearts is because our medicine woman told me when I became chief that you've held many hearts in your hands in the past as a critical care nurse. And now you hold our hearts in your hands as chief. And that's a very solemn and, and a huge honor within our tribe. Um, so I'm gonna chat a little bit about policy and how policy has impacted our tribal women. Um, so since the first contact with European immigrants, the health of our women and our families were changed forever. Um, you know, we were referred to as merciless Indian savages in the Declaration of Independence. And what did that do? That allowed all the settler colonists believe that we were less than, that we were others and to develop policies designed to eliminate us. Our homelands were taken by force, our culture was banished, our indigenous foods and medicine were fenced in and appropriated, our children were kidnapped, traumatizing our communities to this day. So the policies of assimilation, relocation, and termination had devastating effects on our communities. But I believe that our ancestors were resilient and that resilience lives on with us. So despite overwhelming odds, we are here because of them, and we are here to keep faith with them and to ensure that those that we have yet to meet can continue to honor our indigenous ways. Um, and um, I just wanted to make sure my slides are up if they're not up. Oh, perfect, okay, great. Um, and so I would go to the second slide, please. <clears throat> So as you can see here, you know, we, we know what happened. You know, we know how we've gotten to this place. Um, and, you know, it, it's up to us to, you know, to not only, you know, to stop studying the issue because we know how we got to where we are. It's really time for action. So beginning with the Miriam Report in 1934 in the United States, it showed the devastation of indigenous communities and it prompted the enactment of the Snyder Act for the purpose of providing health care to American Indians and Alaska Natives. And following that later on was the Indian Health Care Improvement Act in 1988. But we continue to struggle with full funding, not only in Indian health, but in all of the agencies within federal government. And so I would say that, you know, trust and treaty obligations matter. And, you know, yet the United States has not lived up to its trust and treaty obligations. In 1988, the congressional intent of the Healthcare Improvement Act stated, Congress finds the following, federal health services to maintain and improve the health of Indians are consonant with and required by the federal government's historical and unique legal relationship with and resulting responsibility to the American Indian people. Number two, a major national goal of the United States is to provide the resources, processes, and structures that will enable Indian tribes and tribal members to obtain the quantity and quality of healthcare services and opportunities that will eradicate the health disparities between Indians and a general population of the United States. And that number three, a major goal of the United States was to provide the quantity and quality of health services, which will permit the health of status of Indians to be raised to the highest possible level and to encourage maximum participation of Indian in the planning of those services. Um, so despite all of these services, the unmet health needs of the American Indian people are severe, and the health status of Indians is far below that of the general population of the United States. Now remember, that was 1988. We are still waiting to raise the level of health. Later on, the United States Commission on Civil Rights authored a report, Quiet Crisis, the Federal Funding and Unmet Needs in Indian Country, in 2003, followed by the Broken Promises Report um, in 2016, examining the chronic federal funding shortfalls in Native America. So essentially it shows that if anything, funding for our people has declined with equally poor health outcomes and poor social determinants of health. And I appreciated the discussion on social determinants of health. 
So we all know what the needs are and it's time for us to act, not to study the issue any longer. And in my estimation, now is the time for intensive legislative advocacy and action. So I'm gonna center my comments a bit on safety, environmental justice and trust and treaty obligations as mechanisms that can ensure that the health of our women and thus subsequent generations are met. The statistics around the safety of our native women are abysmal. Our murder rates are at 10 times the national rate with murder being the third leading cause of death for native women 10 to 24 years of age. 56% of our Native women will be victims of sexual violence. There are 5,295 murdered or missing Indigenous women with active records of only 578. Our federal partners have neglected to track and they declined to prosecute in over 50% of these cases. We have 1.9 police officers per 1,000 residents per versus 3.5 per 1,000 residents in the general population. When we lose our women in our communities, we lose mothers, sisters, friends, and subsequent generations. We have shown a light on these issues and have been successful at passing laws that will protect our communities. But it continues to require coordination at all levels of federal government along with our tribal governments. Tribes who were previously unable to prosecute non-Indian perpetrators are now given special criminal jurisdiction over domestic violence perpetrators as a pilot program, and we're looking to codify that ability for all tribes should they choose to do so. We now have a task force called Operation Lady Justice to address the murdered and missing Indigenous women. We've passed Savannah's Act to increase the ability of all governments to access crime databases, increase law enforcement, and improve data around murdered and missing women. We have advocated for the passage of NITOPA which would protect children and tribal officers from violence and allow tribal nations to prosecute crimes against them. We are advocating for the passage of justice for native survivors of sexual violence, which will restore jurisdiction over crimes related to sexual violence. And it's a gap in our Violence Against Women Act. It's important to note that all of Indian country has engaged in these efforts at various congressional hearings to ensure that all of our voices are heard and that our stories are told in a most personal way. Another issue that really is very striking is environmental health. Our children will continue to be disadvantaged from a healthy gestational period and healthy life unless we address these issues. As one of my colleagues, Chief Beverly Cook from Akwesasne Mohawk notes, the first environment a child experiences is in the womb. We need to ensure that all of our mothers are healthy. Given that Indian country is about 3% of all lands in the United States, but 25% of all super funds are located on tribal lands, how do we ensure that our children can live a healthy life? When uranium mines are operating on tribal lands and our pipelines are leaking, how do we have clean water to drink? When not all tribal homes have running water, indoor plumbing or electricity, how do we protect the health of all generations? Tribes in our country ceded lands and most often forcibly were ceding our lands with the expectation that in exchange, our health, education and other rights would be ensured by doing so. The expectations of services are not poverty-based. They were an agreed upon exchange and we expect that our country will live up to its promises. Indeed, the Broken Promises Report notes, the United States expects all nations to live up to their treaty obligations it should live up to its own. Congress should honor the federal government's obligations and pass a spending package that would fully address unmet needs, targeting the most critical needs for immediate investment. So the United States needs to dramatically change how these trust and treaty obligations are funded. Despite being the only people in the United States that have trust and treaty rights to healthcare, Indian Health Services is funded on the discretionary side of the budget meaning it can be eliminated or dramatically reduced given the whims of Congress. And this is in direct contrast to Medicare, Medicaid, and veterans health care, other federal programs that are on the mandatory side of the budget, meaning that no further congressional action is needed and that there are automatic drivers for increases, including population increases, inflation, and technological advances. Other programs related to the social determinants of health are funded using grants, uh, which is not 
upholding the government to government relationship that tribes have with our federal government. At last count, there were over 2,000 grants that tribes were eligible for, but it's like unlikely that any tribe can apply for those grants, administer and report on all those grant sources. Grants are also competitive. They pit tribes against tribes, with tribes with more sophisticated capacities for grant writing being more successful, including tribes with more pressing needs for more successful grant funding. These are just a few examples of how equitable funding vehicles impact our ability to improve the health of our communities, especially our women. Appropriations do indeed equal policy. So our call to action is to hold the highest levels of our government accountable and to work collaboratively to ensure that our government upholds its trust and treaty obligations. We are currently proposing legislation that would move Indian Health Services to the mandatory side of the budget and to fully fund that budget. The delta between average expenditures in the United States in general and American Indians is approximately $6,000 per person per year. That is extremely significant. We are also advocating for tribal offices within the Office of Management and Budget and Treasury. The Office of Management and Budget is especially important given its role in developing the president's budget and in evaluating that budget. It is our sincere wish that we have a voice at that level, the highest level of the federal government to ensure that every agency submitting a budget is upholding its trust and treaty obligation. Our goal is to have each of our tribal communities funded directly by the United States government as an act of self-governance. Only then will tribes be able to provide the services that our tribal citizens deserve, but in keeping with our history, our cultures and our traditional healing methods. We are all in the process of rebuilding what was lost, including our indigenous foodways, our languages, our sacred traditions, our traditional healing, and infusing our culture in all that we do. And lastly, I believe that we need to elect many, many more indigenous women to positions of power. We are so proud of our Secretary of Interior, Deb Halland, for the work that she is doing using an indigenous lens and a strong indigenous voice. There is no substitute for a seat at the table. So whenever you are asked to advocate, whenever you are asked to support legislation, whenever you are asked to give testimony, use your voice. It is what our ancestors always did. We here at Mohegan have a very strong legacy of women always having a voice and having a seat at the table long before the United States recognized women's ability to vote. We were engaged in governance always, and we always will be. That is the legacy that we've been left. So I say, I thank you today for the time to speak, and I wish you all many blessings. Thank you so much, Chief Malarva. That was just great. Um, I know that although we have a lot of similar um, outcomes, probably there's different paths from both sides. And I know uh, for some of you, you may not know, but Indian Health Service is still running Indian hospitals, if you will, <laughs> clinics and other things in the United States. I don't think there's Indian hospitals per se in Canada anymore. Um, and as, as uh, Mary Ellen was Nice enough to say decades and decades and decades, but yes, well, I have worked for, so I've been a nurse for 32 years and very early on, I worked in the Indian Health Service in uh, New Mexico in the Santa Fe Indian Hospital. And the things literally we talked about then, the funding then, you know, at 50% need if you're lucky, um, are still the things we're talking about here in 2021. So, and an important distinction is it doesn't matter who's in, you know, we all, especially right now, it's very, very divided politically in the US, left and right, you know, R&D, whatever you want to say, liberal, conservative, doesn't matter who's in, it rarely changes. And if it does change, maybe just a little tick. So of all the things people fight about, uh, uh, Indian health <laughs> is kind of put on the, the side in the US. It's, it's never in the forefront, which is why, um, um, Marilyn was saying, we really do need to get some indigenous voices, especially indigenous women's voices into the fray down there. So thank you so much for that. And then we will move on to Dr. Shannon McDonald, who is proudly Métis Anishinaabe with deep roots in the Red River Valley of Manitoba. She's acting chief medical officer at the First Nations Health Authority. 
She's trained uh, as a physician with postgraduate medical training in community med medicine and psychiatry, and has worked for over 25 years in the First Nations and Aboriginal health. She has, an ex she has extensive experience both in the federal and provincial government context. And I'll leave it there, uh, Dr. McDonald. Thank you, Ani Bujou. Um, acknowledging our elders and their words, it's always helpful for me to be grounded in that way um, before we speak. And um, I just want to express my honor and appreciation. Um, I'm here to talk about a report uh, that we released in July. And the journey to the report is as important as the report. Um, so I want to. Uh, take a moment to talk about that. Could you pull up the slide, please? Thank you. And just a warning, I had dental surgery yesterday, so I'm a little slurred in my speech. Um, I want to acknowledge a whole bunch of people in this work. Um, the Office of the Chief Medical Officer, so my team, the Office of the Provincial Health Officer, so where Danielle Bain-Smith works with Dr. Bonnie Henry and others. Um, a brilliant artist who did this piece of work, Melanie Rivers, a Squamish woman um, who I asked to do this specifically for this report and she allows us to do it. Um, and Claire Mockery, who's also on the call uh, today, who played a significant role in the writing of this report, could not have done it without you. Um, and the report is honoring and dedicated to the missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. Um, it's been a path that is a journey onward, but a journey full of trips and side roads. Um, and we really want to acknowledge, and I'm actually wearing my red dress earrings today. Um, to honor that. So this report um, is the culmination of a journey in a different way. About 12 years ago, our former provincial health officer, uh, Dr. Um, Kendall, released a report on Indigenous women's health that was technically a terrific report, lots of charts, lots of data, um, and lots of deficits lots of conversation about what was wrong with um, First Nations women in BC. Um, and Indigenous women read the report and said, it doesn't reflect us. I can't see myself in it. Where's our story? Where's our strength? Where's our resilience? Um, so we started more than three years ago on this report in that Ensuing three years, the National Inquiry on Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls took place. The UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People was passed. COVID-19 hit. A toxic drug crisis intensified and disproportionately impacted our population. And the review into anti-Indigenous racism and the In Plain Sight report was conducted. In all of these, First Nations women have shown incredible strength and resiliency. But they've also shown to be recurrently those who were most gravely impacted by these serial crises. And the same themes are woven through this report, the upholding and uplifting of Indigenous women and the survival of our nations our cultures, our communities, and their important role in that as matriarchs at the same time that all of these crises are impacting on them. So while it is a celebration of women's strengths, it is also a reminder of the work, the healing and reconciliation we still have to do. Next slide, please. So you'll note all of the um, photos are from that um, piece that was done by Melanie. And it helps us reflect that this uh, report was done uh, through the life course. So every life stage is represented. Um, and I want to acknowledge 
uh, Danielle Bain Smith's voice in this because I always hear her when we start talking about two eyed seeing um, and our strengths based report reporting. Not only is there a quantitative um, piece to this report and, and continues to be, we're working on a technical report that will attach to this that should be released in the next few months. But the really important piece of this report is the voices and stories of lived experience of First Nations women and girls. I also want to acknowledge that we're stuck with the binary because we were challenged by what data was available. So I want to acknowledge the voices of people who do not fit within that either or spectrum um, and that we need to do a better job of recognizing um, all gender identification, no matter where people put themselves on that spectrum. So we are following the life stage approach and that's how the chapters are planned. And we're, the plan was to design a reference point against which to measure improvements in data collection and in First Nations data governance, both of which have been extremely important uh, pieces of this work and continue to be. And it represents a new approach to reporting on First Nations women's wellness grounded in the teachings and holding up of the health of First Nations women and girls as an indicator of health and wellness of society as a whole. Now, I also want to acknowledge that indigeneity is not limited to First Nations, but our data is. And as um, the chief medical officer at the First Nations Health Authority, what we hold is a First Nations client file where we can identify and do data linkage with other data sets to identify specifically First Nations women and girls. The Métis Nation in BC are doing similar work with their data sets. We do not have really good information about the Inuit population, nor do we have great information about the non-status population. So those are all limitations in this report. Next, please. So I'm gonna go through very, at a very high level, um, some of the, um, some of the chapters and what, do we, what we have, just to give you an example of what's in the report. The data piece on this is the increased percentage of First Nations women with a midwife as their primary healthcare provider during pregnancy, a significant increase from 2009 to 2015, but reflecting not just the quantitative piece, but also the words of Jessica St. Jean. For indigenous people, birth is supposed to be a ceremony. A life giver is bringing a whole new life into the world. So acknowledging not just the data, but the experience. Next, please. One of the things we hear most frequently, especially from our young people, is the need for supports in the area of mental health and wellness. This data comes from a study of adolescents and ratings of stress, depression, and anxiety by young Indigenous women. And it's actually really good news. 80% had never had an anxiety disorder or a panic attack. 80% had not felt extremely stressed in the last month. And 77% had no feelings of depression. So very much focusing on the strengths of those women while acknowledging that is not 100% and we still have a ways to go. And Megan's words, and I apologize, I am not good at <laughs> BC Indigenous languages. I'm a prairie girl and I do the best I can, but I struggle a little bit. In Megan's words, for me, staying well during COVID comes with connecting to my spirituality and healing my spirit. It comes with harvesting our traditional foods and medicines. It comes with speaking my native tongue, 
learning my family history and the history of my nation. It comes with singing, drumming, and dancing to our songs. Next slide, please. Adult wellness is such a broad subject and it is a real challenge. Leah George Wilson in the blue dot on the left, the greatest gift I've been given by my elders is the gift of knowing who I am as Tsleil-Waututh. Someday my generation will be elders and I worry about that. What if we don't know enough? What if we forget? And then I remember my grandparents and my parents and I know that we will be okay. From HealthSick Nation, Carrie Easterbrook, the Kunsut Wellness Center, and I apologize for the pronunciation if I'm wrong, came to life as a result of our nation saying, we need to take care of ourselves and we need to be well. We have a right to wellness. There's been a common theme through many, many generations as what we do, we need, what do we need to be well? And the answer has been quite simple. It's that we need to stay connected to our land and our resources and our culture and our community. And that land-based wellness center, um, HealthSick, I'm gonna get that one right. My assistant would kill me, she's HealthSick. Um, an inclusive, accessible, and safe space for land-based healing and learning, purpose built by the members of the community to promote wellness. The center will provide a safe and comfortable space to run healing and wellness programs out of the land, accessible year-round for all mobility levels, and available to all the agencies in who run all the agencies in who run or aspire to run land-based programs. Next, please. Our honored elders. I was raised by a grandmother who died in her own home six weeks short of her 100th birthday. She raised 11 children brought more children into the house during the war years when her sons were fighting the war and then raised my brother and I while she was in her 80s and never stopped. So I have a particular place in my heart for a lady with knitting needles and a rocking chair in the corner of the kitchen. And one of the things that elders really focused on in the work that we did was a sense of balance. The percentage of older First Nations women who felt they were in balance in all aspects of wellness was actually not as high as I would have hoped. 57.9% felt balanced most or all of the time and 10% some of the time. So there's a lot of people out there who need support in finding that wellness. Jane Jones from Seychat, my secret to aging well is in lifestyle choices. Eating well and staying active, abstaining from alcohol and cigarettes. I grew up eating locally grown vegetables and fruit, lots of salmon and seafood. We rarely ate beef. I juice regularly, mostly vegetables. Keeping mobile is very important. I enjoy swimming, gardening, and being with kids. It keeps you young. Next, please. So I think one of the challenges that we have, and I really gave some thought to the actions going forward, and I, I, I want to reiterate some of the things about this report, that it is focused on the voices of women. It is focused on wellness and resilience and strength. But I also want to acknowledge the places that we didn't get to go to on this report that pull us forward to the next report. The issues of data governance and self-determination are so strong and we still have so much work to do. 
And very specifically, I want to acknowledge the gender specific non-binary world in which we live. We struggled with how to identify that and report and we often use the term woman identifying though it's absolutely inadequate. And we want to acknowledge the unique needs and experiences of all of the people in the community and make sure they have what they need. So thank you. Oh, sorry. Thank you, Dr. McDonald. It's, it's nice to see some hopeful information out there and to be able to hear from the women themselves where they see themselves in the story and so forth. So thank you for that. And then our final speaker on the panel is Dr. Mary Ellen Tropella Fong Akikwe. She's the director of uh, sorry, academic director of the Dialogue Center from which this is coming out of, Canadian lawyer, former judge, legislative advocate for children's rights, and professor in UBC's Allard School of Law. And I will leave it there. You probably all know her and Mary Ellen. Thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to um, thank the other panelists. Um, I just wanted to have a chance to talk about some of the findings from In Plain Sight with respect to the experiences of women. So I just ask for the slides to be loaded, please. And uh, so we can advance through that. So first of all, as I said earlier, it's been a year since this report was completed. It was a small team that did it, including uh, my co-lead Harmony Johnson, who's in our virtual room and many of the participants on this panel and others. Um, if we could advance, please. Um, in terms of what we found in British Columbia around discrimination, racism, and stereotypes, there's rampant continuing anti-Indigenous racism. And with respect to the kinds of racism or stereotypes, this is a fairly elaborate chart, but it really identifies how stereotypes, discrimination work together, causing uh, there to be a situation where there's less access to healthcare and poor outcomes. And so we've been talking about that a little bit in the previous panels, but I just really wanted to talk about those linkages in that circle and, and how they're compounded. I think as Dr. Shannon McDonald noted with the matriarch study, the intersection of these um, prejudices and discrimination and how they weigh in the actual lives of women at the point of care and women creating space and creating uh, space for gender diversity and safety for all people to have access to healthcare without discrimination. And discrimination looks a lot like denial of service, abusive interactions, ignoring and shunning, a lot of um, opportunities for medical mistakes. And although the report and the research is now, um, the data report came out in February, 2021, but it's just about a year old. I think it's important to also note that the current um, emergencies that we're dealing with in British Columbia, in particular, the, the ongoing COVID-19 um, public health emergency and other um, climate change and environmental emergencies have compounded the impact. So likely we've seen some worsening of these conditions in the past year and the need to analyze those. Next slide, please. Around the experiences of um, of women and the key observations that I can certainly share is that Indigenous women experience misogynistic stereotyping. And we saw this in a lot of examples of Indigenous women receiving comments about how many women, how many children we have, um, the idea that Indigenous women have a higher pain threshold and therefore don't need pain medication, the idea that Indigenous women are like sexualized, sexually available, um, and some other those stereotypes that have been in place for so long that the other panelists have spoken to. Um, certainly Indigenous men were 83% more likely to feel completely safe when visiting an ED or emergency department than women. Um, and at our only specialty hospital in British Columbia, the BC Women's Hospital, First Nations women left against medical advice at a rate that was 11 times greater than anyone else. And that really speaks to the environment of cultural safety. And it also addresses a stereotype that is prevalent in the research community and in the practice community that we found, which is the suggestion that 
indigenous women only experience racism or stereotyping or poor service in rural and remote areas, when in fact it was consistent throughout British Columbia at all points. And um, in fact, in rural and remote, like in the Northern Health region as an example, where Margo um, works, there have been like vigorous efforts to expose and address it. And um, I think that it's really important not to overly load it in one sort of set of beliefs. In terms of Indigenous women having great need for healthcare services but not having access, um, we did look at things like PAP screening among Indigenous women, why it continues to be lower when there's a higher cancer burden, and of course, service gaps. And in particular, you know, from a matriarch view of wanting to support Indigenous women's access to health throughout the sort of lifespan, but especially with respect to reproductive and menopausal periods and postmenopause, it is kind of shocking in British Columbia, despite this, you know, intense effort and the great leadership that many of you will see here um, addressing these matters that we don't have especially specialty matriarch clinic or service on a provincial level and that we're still advocating place by place and there isn't any sort of specialized service stream there. Next slide please. In terms of um, how Indigenous women are disproportionately affected by poor health, first of all by early adulthood, you know half of First Nations and Métis women experience five or more morbidities which is twice the rate that we've seen for males or non-Indigenous females. Indigenous women have high degrees of acute and chronic diseases. Um, many of those um, obviously compounded by poor access throughout the lifespan. Um, for instance, um, First Nations female death rate due to, to opiate overdoses, particularly in 2020, which was our year that we were able to assess, was twice as high than non-Indigenous women. And the COVID-19 pandemic and First Nations women are overrepresented in the number of confirmed cases and the risk. So the burden is immense. And in terms of the, the key sort of activities around planning, reporting and accountability related to Indigenous women's health, we still have a lot of deficiencies. I mean, we've, we've you know, pulled together a panel of very skilled people so, and, and throughout this conference, but we've seen that the problems have been surfaced um, but there still um, is a challenge to sustain that leadership and expose and understand that um, reality for Indigenous women. Next slide, please. The um, report that was released a year ago had 24 recommendations. So 10 were about the system, nine was about behavior of people in the system, and four were really about the beliefs that ground the system. And I'm just going to speak to one of the recommendations, uh, recommendation 16, which was that the BC government implement immediate measures to respond to the missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls calls for justice. And they should address finishing the Indigenous Women's Health Report and refreshing the data, establishing specialty services for Indigenous women, including, as I said, uh, developing a province-wide specialty service for perimenopause, menopause, and postmenopausal women's health access. And I just want to pause to talk about why that was so important, is to have a high-quality, safe provincial resource. We do have some provincial resources in BC at, say, BC Children's Hospital that provide expertise to all of our health authorities and at the point of care. But on Indigenous women, we don't have a similar um, uh, practice and we haven't really shaped or developed it and it's a massive deficit in particular because Indigenous women even in the perimenopausal menopausal and postmenopausal period tend to be, have a higher caregiving burden they're often raising grandchildren and others they're struggling with chronic health issues they frequently are forced to exit the workforce and cannot continue to participate in the workforce because of unmet medical needs um, and they are often wait, waiting and referred and not receiving accessible coordinated services. Um, so some of these um, challenges are really significant around how do we best support our matriarchs? That's really a key point. And can our matriarchs navigate care? And frankly, they can't navigate care. And the care that they do get um, is not adequate and not safe. And so we still have those challenges. In terms of enhancing access to maternal, child, and reproductive health, again, very significant. 
uh, to have Indigenous streams. Um, Dr. McDonald talked about midwifery and other changes. Well, there is upticks and there are upticks. They're very slow. And the prenatal period in particular is one where we need to really increase safety and coordination between our provincial health authorities, First Nations health services and community health services. Next slide, please. Um, so just a couple closing thoughts. And again, the complete report that we've done um, is available for you to, re to um, see, including sort of updates on it. But I will be releasing today a statement on my reflections on one year after the report to sort of see how have those recommendations been going forward. Um, I will say that there have been some progress, um, but I don't think the systemic approaches are there. The strategies or investment targets that are needed to be specific to Indigenous women in healthcare are still missing. And there's a lot of great work to be done. So again, I have to ask like the fundamental questions, which is, well, we all have our sort of perceptions, our experiences and our awarenesses in our different points of like leadership or experience. Has anything really changed for Indigenous women at the point of care over the past year? And what are we doing every day to respond to this crisis? And so my call to action, if you like, is to actually implement the recommendations of the report from a year ago and to keep an unflinching focus across health leadership in British Columbia um, on the need to address the incredible burden that Indigenous women face and to ease that burden, increase accessibility, and to do innovation in a way that's culturally safe and women-centered and women-led. Thank you. Sorry, I see I was on mute. <laughs> but anyway, thank you, Mary Ellen. Um, I'm conscious of the time. Uh, there's about one more minute for this session, so I'm not sure if we should um, Go ahead and take a question or save it till the end. What, what are your thoughts? I think Dr. Moss, we should probably take at least one of the questions. Okay. And um, I did note that um, there was a really interesting question by Daisy Dooley. I don't know if you see that one. Okay, sure. Um, so here's one question from Daisy. How are the indigenous organizations working together and with governments to highlight and fight the inequities across the world as the challenges faced here are similar in, to elsewhere due to colonization. So whoever wants to, who wants to jump on in, how are organizations across the world working? Anybody? So I, I think it's through um, it's through some of these conversations because we've been having some international conversations around even genetic studies, um, and so they've been really helpful. But the other thing that I think that people have been advocating for is a seat at the UN uh, for Native Nations. And so you know, if we want to think big, I think we need to think big about that. And so there's been a lot of testimony, and there's been a lot of discussion around how. Indigenous communities are going to participate in the United Nations. Yeah, thank you for that, Chief Malerba. Um, yeah, there is a whole uh, sense of similar, um, as I said, between uh, Canada and the US, but especially in the four settler states, adding in Australia, New Zealand, of, uh, we, can, we come to the same sort of outcomes, even if it might be by slightly different paths and histories. Um, so. Yeah, that would be great <laughs> to have a seat there. Um, here's a, I'll do a short one, sorry. Um, as a settler, this is Cheryl. As a settler, how can I get involved to advocate for permanent federal funding as Chief Malerva describes appropriations to policy? I'm sorry, I just you again. But. Well, I, you know, I think any time that we can lend our voices, one of the things that I think is going to be most important is to be working with health economists to say, all right, well, there's a cost to fully funding, but what is the cost 
to our to our nations for not funding. And that's something that's never been explored. We know because we see the outcomes. Um, but it seems to me that what we cannot get to a good place until we have good preventive care, until we have good social determinants of health, and all of those are connected. So in any organization, so, so many times I think that we're speaking to our echo chambers, which is we all know what the issue is, mm -hmm. uh, but we need to engage other people. So whether it's the medical associations or the nurses associations, we need to pull in the power of of multiple voices, um, because unfortunately, that is the only way we will be heard sometimes. And anybody else on the panel from the Canadian perspective, not necessarily of US funding, but how can a settler uh, become involved in uh, the advocacy and so forth? Uh, Dr. Greenwood. I think one of the things, and I mentioned it earlier, um, this work is huge and it's complex and it's multi layered. So I always start at the place, what is my sphere of influence? Where do I work and who can I influence? And I think that's really important for any of us that are doing this important work, allies, as well as us Indigenous women. And I think also making those connections, real connections with community, connections with other Indigenous people that you work with, because it's from them that you'll learn. And they'll show you in a particular context, if you will. I think that our people are really gracious about teaching. I'll say that. Um, I've had some gracious teachers. Um, but those are the folks that will show you and teach you in your particular context of how to move the agenda forward. I don't think uh, those agendas need to be led um, by Indigenous people. And so the role of the ally is to support that leadership and particularly our women. Yeah, that's a good point. We, we need to lead, can't do it alone. So there's plenty of room for people who do want to um, jump in and help make a difference here. So um, I think that I will go ahead. I think we are going to have more room at the end of the conference for questions. So I think I will pass it on for the next panel to Mary Ellen to lead. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Moss, and thank you to the, the first panel and um, certainly framed the issues about the structural and intersectional forces that are facing and shaping Indigenous women health and well-being, not just in British Columbia, but in Canada and in the US. Um, in this next panel, and again, and I apologize that we are squeezing a lot in, we don't have a lot of breaks, so <clears throat> if people need a little shut off your camera break, please go ahead because we're going to keep foraging on. In this panel, we're going to seek to understand a little bit more about the existing and necessary initiatives and interventions that create justice, safety, and substantive equality for Indigenous women. And in particular, we want to probe and understand what work is underway to respond to recommendations related to Indigenous women's health. What is creating obstacles or what are the obstacles for equity for Indigenous women? Who needs to clear the pathway? What are some of the short-term actions that we need to create justice, safety, and of substantive equality for Indigenous women as patients and caregivers? And to comment on these issues, we have um, five panelists. Um, we have Dr. Nadine Caron, who's at the Faculty of Medicine at UBC, co-director of the Center for Excellence in Indigenous Health. And um, again, all of their bios are going to be appearing in the chat, but we're so fortunate to have Dr. Caron. We have Dr. Kate Elliott from the Métis Nation of British Columbia. Really honored to have you with us today. Dr. Terry Aldred, who's the medical director of the First Nations Health Authority and a current expert on reproductive medicine as well. <laughs> and uh, we have Leslie Vonshore, who I'm so excited is with us, and she's the Vice President of Indigenous Health for Ben Coastal Health, and Don Thomas, who's the Associate Deputy Minister of the Ministry of Health and took on senior leadership position just about a year ago to lead um, some of the transformation in Indigenous health in the government of BC. So I'm going to start um, by turning it over to Dr. Nadine Caron to offer and share her views with us. Welcome. Thank you so, so much, Ani. 
uh, Chi Miigwech for the honor of being part of this vital event. Um, and to be on this virtual panel with these amazing leaders, I'm scrolling through and looking at these beautiful faces and wise, wise leadership. Um, thank you, thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to join uh, everyone that's on this learning circle via Zoom. Uh, and I'm just sort of thinking and imagining the people that are taking time out of their day to recognize the importance of this one year anniversary of sorts and, and thinking of the passion and the interest, the commitment, the curiosity and the questions that I'm seeing scrolling in in the Q&A that I really hope that you'll bring. And, and I hope that this uh, next session will stimulate. Uh, I myself am a member of the Sagamok Anishinaabek First Nation uh, and I'm a visitor on this beautiful traditional ancestral unceded territory of the Clay Lake otherwise known by perhaps the most colonial term uh, in Canada, Prince George, British Columbia. Uh, but it's where the UBC Northern Medical Program is, uh, and I'm joining you uh, from here today. Uh, as we know, the title of this panel is Responding to the Recommendations, looking at work already underway to address the in plain sight recommendation, among other recommendations uh, that we know that we've been tasked with in the profession of healthcare. Um, I was asked to share some very brief thoughts, perhaps on, on what is working and where the barriers are. So I was thinking about this and on some days, I head into these institutions that we call hospitals, health clinics, universities, and, and I carry these kind of titles. I'm a doctor, I'm a surgeon, I'm a teacher, I'm a researcher. Other days, I may look the same on the outside, um, same height, you know, same clothes, um, same person, but I walk into these same medical buildings of bricks and mortar, but I'm a sister, I'm a daughter, I'm a mother, I'm a learner, or I'm a patient. And in both roles, I have witnessed and I have felt the stories described in the In Plain Sight report. And talking to colleagues when that first came out, before it came out and after it came out, people like these amazing female Indigenous physicians when we're sort of talking about this. It's Shannon McDonald, it's not Nell Wyman, of course, Terry Aldridge coming up in the panel later. The, the list goes on. We all nodded our heads. We'd heard these stories, maybe not these specific stories, um, but boy, did they sound familiar. And like so many, when I was talking to colleagues, it, it, there, there was pain to hear the stories but frustration that these stories in the In Plain Sight when it was covered in the media were treated as news. See, I'm of the belief that news should be new. But while these stories were so courageously shared and were the soul of the report that Mary Ellen and her team put forward in terms of the recommendations, I'm hoping the recommendations will hopefully give it the oxygen to breathe. Like the Truth and Reconciliation Report and the 94 Calls to Action, so I thought I would share with you where I think there's an example of overlap in the, the two, like the calls to action and the recommendations of these two processes and how our UBC Center for Excellence in Indigenous Health, which houses the Learning Circle in partnership with the First Nations Health Authority, has put so much effort into the role of advocacy on the requirement for post-secondary institutions. And let's say it, you know, UBC, because that's where, that's where I'm, I'm based, is accountable. Uh, to honoring these stories and the courage and the outcome from these two processes. So given our limited time, I wanna share one program that we created to address a significant gap in the curriculum, not just at the UBC Medical School, but we reached out to try to engage all healthcare professionals um, and within the UBC Health. So hold on one second here. My husband's on call. Welcome to healthcare. So basically UBC Health, um, we called it UBC 2324 and it was named to, address the, to directly address the calls to action number 2324 in the truth and reconciliation under the health umbrella. So, you know, the TRC had health, it had justice, it had education. Well, under health 23, part of it was calls to action were to call upon all levels of government to provide cultural competency training for all healthcare professionals. And number 24 was to require all students to take a course dealing with Aboriginal health issues, including the history and uh, legacy of Indian residential schools, 
UNDRIP or the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, Treaties and Aboriginal Rights and Indigenous Teachings and Practices. So this TRC 2324 calls to action dovetailed really nicely with the In Plain Sight report five years later in 2020 with recommendation number 20 that called for curricula in anti-racism, cultural humility and trauma-informed training. You can notice some of the slightly different wording and that's just with the evolution of time in terms of changing cultural competency to cultural humility, but it was still there five years later, front and center in terms of what was needed obviously demonstrating that something wasn't happening despite the calls to action. So UBC 2324 was developed by a team at the Center for Excellence with the type of advisory and consultation recommended by uh, Mary Ellen and her amazing team. The resulting interdisciplinary mixed model of online modules and in-person workshops were co-facilitated by Indigenous and non-Indigenous facilitators and are offered every year to first year healthcare professional students at UBC. It was first offered in August 2017 is when it started. And as of November of this year, it has now been completed by 4,500 health professional program students at UBC. Training for facilitators has changed from one, one and a half hours if you can make it to actually formal training that takes facilitators about 15 to 20 hours to complete, including a full day workshop. We pair indigenous facilitators, a mixture of faculty, staff and community members, with non-Indigenous facilitators who aspire to learn and be part of the solution to address Indigenous specific racism. And of course, all those kind of kinder terms like bias, assumptions, negative stereotypes. But I really, one of the things I, I really appreciated about the In Plain Sight report is that on the surface, on the cover, it really is specific to the R word in terms of Indigenous specific racism, because I think that we're starting to call things what they are. But as our number of students who completed this foundational curricular experience at the center grew and our facilitator pro pool has grown to be what we've been told is the largest in Canada, we really have acknowledged that there's more to be done. We need to tweak it and continue to improve it based on the evaluation from students and facilitators. We need to create curriculum that is the, the back, this backbone, but specific for faculty and staff and advanced students in masters and PhDs. We need to, if we're gonna create it, implement them. And I love sports. So, you know, I know Drew Saint Laurent, who's like a key person at the center, um, is going to laugh at this, but I can't go without using a sports analogy. So it's kind of like, let's say women's soccer at the Olympics, which even if you didn't like sports, you, you hopefully heard about the Canadian women's soccer team. And so I think like it, it's like a preseason, a season and a lifelong career. I think really, you know what, the UBC 23-24, we're like in the preseason. It's very exciting uh, because you can't lose in the preseason. Um, it's, you know, lots of engagement. Everyone's working hard. You want to make the team uh, and you want to get off to a good start. And then the season starts, you know, and this is actually not only 23-24 and the training in the, in the university, but it's also going from that comfort of being a trainee to being out and being a healthcare provider in the healthcare system uh, and having that responsibility, that's your season. And then the lifelong career recognizing you gotta, you can't just take one course. This is a foundation and you've got to go on and keep on learning, learning from your mistakes, learning from your patients, learning from their stories. Um, and then we also have to see the value in sport or you can change, you can change it. You could be music. Uh, for Melanie Rivers at the center, or for Cynthia Long, who's with the Learning Circle, art. You know, you see the value in sport or music and art, and you realize that these continue to be a part of who you are and what you stand for and what you value. And that's what cultural safety and humility is if you want the honor of being a healthcare provider in this country. We need to work to make, to meet our responsibility as UBC to have an active presence in the healthcare system. The one that the, the healthcare system that in plain sight actually did the inquiry on. See, healthcare programs on an average are about four years, but programs like medicine take another two to six years of training after that. UBC Medicine just last year graduated in 2020, the first graduating class that actually took 23, 24 in their first year of medical school. But it'll be another year and a half before those training to be family doctors even hang up their shingles. It'll be years before specialists that are still in their training that took 23, 24 will hang up their shingles and start their clinical careers. So are we gonna wait that long? 
are we going to say, oh, we're doing our job at UBC, we're training our students now, and then a decade down the road, they're going to start having an impact, but they're going to be junior healthcare providers. Are they going to be able to change the system when they're working with colleagues that are 20 years their seniors? What about the active footprint UBC has on the current healthcare system? The system that, the, um, that we were talking about, I think what we can do with both TRC and the Plain Sight Report is we can make it mandatory. We can make it available for trainees that come from other universities into the province, whether it's residencies or internships, practicums, basically when they're somewhere in their training spectrum, we can make it a requirement to be UBC faculty, those that serve as active teachers to our healthcare providers that are gonna be there in the future, role models, mentors in the training space, and in doing so, they're UBC faculty, both academic and clinical faculty. We can take it a step further. We can make it non-negotiable for medical researchers, those who are working with Indigenous communities, organizations, patients, those who want access to that patient file, client file that Shannon was talking about. And we can embed it in the workspace by training UBC staff to make it a culturally safe space to be. So we started to take this step in 2019. We started the work of adjusting 23-24 curriculum, not only for first-year healthcare provider students, that was created with the individual's knowledge, suggestions, guidance from advisory, wisdom from elders, knowledge keepers, but we've actually started to create a version of this for different audiences, faculty and staff. Why expand this, the pool of those of 23, 24 available? Well, first of all, we need to start to be accountable. UBC is the only medical school in the province, meaning that every healthcare or every physician that's trained in BC comes from UBC. We have the only faculty of pharmacy. We have the only dentistry faculty. We have the largest nursing faculty and the list goes on and on. We have a huge responsibility at UBC to address this. We need to be accountable for all who consider themselves part of UBC Health, students, staff, faculty, researchers, and provide this training. As it stands now, UBC 2324 is really gaining momentum. But remember, I think we're in the preseason. It's becoming more embedded. We're getting excited for the season, but it's also, its success is also creating what I would call an inversion. And what I mean by that is first year students are required in many of the faculties to take these face-to-face -face workshops, but we need facilitators to train these students. Attendance is mandatory for the students, but the faculty that they look up to, the faculty that they aspire to be like, feel ill-prepared or not capable of teaching it. What other curriculum at a post-secondary education institution is required for first-year students, but the practicing healthcare providers and faculty in those programs don't feel comfortable teaching it? When I first started out as faculty at UBC, cultural awareness was the original term. Cultural competency came later. They were considered insightful, advanced, forward-thinking, uh, but they were not anywhere close to formal curriculum. Now they should be mandatory, expected, non-negotiable. Perhaps we should go a step further. I love the idea of the United Nations. Perhaps when it comes to curriculum like this, maybe it should be tied to graduation. Maybe it should be a, a, a tie to if you get accepted into programs. Maybe it should be tied to whether you have the honor, the privilege of having a license to practice in any of the healthcare professions in BC. Accountability, oh, we're aiming to do that. And we look forward to the ongoing support of the university, the government, leaders in our professions and individuals who are honored to be healthcare professionals. Now, where in all of this is indigenous women? Hmm. We're in this space to lead. And I think the panels today, I, I wish I could be here for the whole day. I chose to fo focus on indigenous peoples, knowing that there are unique perspectives, but indigenous specific racism is massive. And I think we need to bind together and be one major force, one major team before we start breaking up teams into different positions and working on specific skill sets. I think we need to stick together, but not lose the pride. Look at the panel today. I am so honored. Remember in the beginning, we're mothers, we're grandmothers, we're daughters, we're sisters, we're aunties, we're granddaughters. We're also physicians, we're researchers, we're healthcare administrators, we're teachers, we're caregivers, we're neighbors, we're kind strangers. Sometimes things can seem so complex, but quite honestly, sometimes they're just so darn simple. When my daughter graduated from elementary school because 
I guess we celebrate those kind of things now more than we did when I was a kid. I gave her the sign and it, it, it hangs on her door still. And it just says, in a world where you can be anything, be kind. And I think really sometimes it's as simple as that. She make which. Thank you so much. That just was so heartfelt and touching. And obviously, Dr. Caron, your work is pathbreaking and just reminding us that at this point, everybody comes through <laughs> some schools like UBC and they have to get it right and really acknowledge all of your work there to transform education and build a leadership. And it made me think of the issue of cultural loading, which is sometimes for Indigenous women in leadership, there's so much responsibility and <laughs> not a lot of teams, but um, your, your words are so powerful. I want to um, open um, the floor now to Dr. Kate Elliott and just say again how happy we are to have you, Dr. Elliott. Dr. Elliott is the Minister of Mental Health and Addictions for the Métis Nation in British Columbia, but also has been completing a residency in an inner city context and has a great deal of experience at the front line of the healthcare system, as well as being a political leader and contributing in terms of transformation of the healthcare system in British Columbia um, and ensuring that Métis women and girls are heard and respected. So over to you. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Kate. Thank you so much. I just wanna uh, acknowledge uh, Elder Doris and Elder Roberta who opened us up in a good way. Uh, my name is Kate Elliott. I am calling in from the Lacorn and Speaky People's Territory in Victoria, BC. Um, um, I feel like I should be sitting at the feet of all the amazing matriarchs and powerhouses that we have here um, on the panel. Um, I have been working in the healthcare system for about uh, 12, 12 years. I started as, off as a healthcare worker. I did my nursing um, and I was a little bit of a, you know, spitfire and I wanted people to, to listen to my ideas. Um, so I'm like, oh, I'm going to go tangle with the academy. Um, I had the privilege of actually working with youth in my own community, looking at the impact of institutionalized racism and structural violence and how that impacts their health and well-being. Um, we got to go surfing. It was super awesome. Um, you know, uh, really uh, fostering and upholding uh, their voices. I had the opportunity to uh, study um, medicine at the University of Saskatchewan and then recently graduated from the Indigenous program here. I uh, got to do my residency in a very uh, unique clinical or opportunity uh, working with the inner city population at Kool-Aid. Um, and it was an amazing opportunity to work with other Indigenous physicians and to really be able to re-envision what care can be like. Um, I think one of the things I reflect on quite often we, even though we know there's all of uh, the racism, we know the health outcomes, but for some weird reason, people try and still put the circle through the square shape sorter and be like, why won't you guys fit? And I think uh, reflecting on this and um, my leadership roles as co-chair of the Implant Site Task Force with uh, John Thomas, who you'll hear from later. I think when we, we reflect on this, the importance of listening and not just listening and nodding, but clearing your mind, not thinking about what you want to say, not how you want to defend the system, um, but really hearing our partners, our leaders, um, and our patients. And I think, you know, the In Plain Sight report was so powerful because all of a sudden this can no longer go under the rug can no longer be swept away. I think none of us were surprised in the stats that we heard. And like Dr. Karen said, why is this news? We've been saying this for a really long time, but it took a different entity to say it, to validate our experience. And I think that's one of the first things we need to reflect on is, you know, the amount of work and effort we have to put to be validated when like, just take our word for it. We've been doing it for a long time. Just trust us, like we could do something so much cooler if we had the opportunity um, to do the good work instead of um, to prove and, and justify our existence, our experiences. Um, 
a very um, uplifting uh, story from after the in plain sight. I had a patient who was very, very ill. And, um, you know, he w would not go to the emergency department, you know, and I think working within the, the system, you know, and especially with everything going on in the world, sometimes I felt like a police officer, like I felt like I was part of the problem. And I had this patient and he said, it's not me. They can't treat me like this. I now know this. And, you know, that really highlighted how it wasn't just, you know, institutionalized racism. It really brought down to that core and that shame. And none of our people should feel shame. And I think that's really, it was really uplifting to hear him say, no, I'm going to fight back. I'm going to say, no, you can't treat me like this. And it was just such an um, heartwarming thing to see that tangible thing from, from the report uh, really positively impacting um, our patients that we serve. Um, I think from a MET perspective, uh, the work that's being done on the In Plain Sight Task Force and being, being recognized uh, quite often in BC, we still carry that in invisibility. We often try and still remain hidden and to be seen and represented in the report was a huge step forward. I think I re never knew how, how well we were, how good we were at hiding um, from one but when I went to Saskatchewan, you know, you heard Métis, you saw Métis, um, and it was acknowledged in the territorial acknowledgements. And I think we're just starting to come out, um, reflecting on some of the research I had the opportunity to do with my own youth. Um, their biggest voice and what they said was their determinant of health is they want people to know who they are. They want to be able to come and speak and be proud and not um, interrogated and not asked to defend not only Métis people, but all Indigenous peoples in Canada and justify their experience. And I think um, my really big take home point for our, our partners that are, that are listening is know who we are, you know, before you meet with us. Do, do a little bit of research and ask and come and open with a, an open heart. Um, and I think we're coming, we're coming a long way, but you know, we still, we still hear stories about, I went to get my COVID vaccine and I got labeled as an unknown. And that, that hurts. And it's down to that soul. And, you know, I think um, we have a long way to go to repair that, that relationship. And what we need to do is do that by, by really listening. And um, for a lot of us, we will feel uncomfortable, but you need to embrace the, that feeling of being uncomfortable. I think with our patients, they're uncomfortable. They're so uncomfortable to the point where they run. We saw the stats around women who left against medical advice from the emergency department. That's a fear, fight or flight response. And I think um, taking the time and acknowledging as healthcare providers that they are the experts. And, you know, we talk about this all the time, but really, you know, put the clipboard down. Don't ask your 50 questions. Listen, like our people will tell you what they need and where to go from here. Um, I am done my, my, my ramblings and I'm going to uh, listen now. So... Uh, Gina Gwich, thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Kate. Really appreciated your comments. And um, when Kate was mentioning she's on the task force, there is a task force. I'm probably Don will speak about it in a bit. That's been um, seized with implementing the work. And again, thank you for your leadership at every level, service in political organization, but also in system change. And again, almost all of the women here today are not just wearing a number of hats, but they're advancing the work in a variety of ways that is like quite significant. And I wanna turn it over. I'm just so honored as well that we have Dr. Terry Aldred with us. And in particular, because we wanna have a really good understanding of how issues are shaping up in different parts of um, British Columbia. And Terry's working um, 
in particular in the 12 sort of communities in North Central BC. And it's really helpful for us to understand like how are these issues impacting different regions, but also as practitioners, are there similarities? So just very honored that you're um, with us today, Terry, and uh, over to you. Hello, thank you so much for having me. Uh, I'm just going to start a timer. Um, I have a bad habit of going over, so <laughs> it'll help me keep me on track. Um, so Hadith, my name is Terry Aldred. I'm Beth Keth from Clasden, a member of the Silu the Frog Clan. Um, and I'm calling in today from the Clayley traditional territory in the home of um, many of my relatives at the um, otherwise known as uh, Nadine said as Prince George. Um, and I do work in Caris uh territory, serving 12 First Nations communities, which I've done since I graduated um, from the Indigenous Family Medicine Program. And so um, I have a bit to cover, so I'm going to try to dive in. Um, so um, I wanted to use the concept of a cycle. And as um, women, um, we, we run with the cycles. Um, and so I wanted to share stories that represent different parts of, of, our, of our cycle as women. Um, starting first, uh, when we think of the North or new life, um, and um, also transitioning back into the spirit world um, to share. We cycle um, when we go through our moon times, we cycle with the moon on a monthly basis. Um, when we um, go through pregnancy and become mothers, we cycle through the seasons. Um, and, and then our life is a cycle. And so when we think of, again, coming into this world, um, being born, um, representing that North, and then going into, um, you know, our youth um, and our young adulthood, kind of representing um, that newness, that East. Um, and then we enter into motherhood, which is um, going into summer, our full, uh, reaching our full state of fertility um, and, um, you know, cultivating our gifts and however we do that, whether that whether that's actually becoming mothers or cultivating careers or projects and other things. And then going into the West and representing our, um, as we go into um, become elders um, and knowledge keepers and wise people. Um, and so um, with that, uh, I wanted to start um, by sharing a story about um, me and my youth. Um, and in particular, um, you know, I come from, um, I come from the inner city um, as well as on reserve. And so I was really brought up in um, recognizing the effects of colonialism and um, the effects of isolation and segregation. Um, and although I know it's not the same for many indigenous people, school is actually a safe place for me um, with a predictable rules that providing I followed those rules, people praised me um, and nurtured me. And that was true um, up until I entered um, medical school. And I often describe medical school as both the best thing and the worst thing that ever happened to me. And um, in my first couple of years, um, there was a lot of good. Um, in my first two months, I never set foot on a plane that wasn't in my realm of possibilities. Um, and I was on a plane and I went to Ottawa um, and I sat on this panel. Um, and, uh, and that was these experiences, these doors that opened for me um, were life-changing in a lot of ways. Um, and, and now as a practicing physician, I do have a lot of privilege. Um, and as I journeyed through medical school, um, I met so many amazing um, Indigenous and non-Indigenous people who also went through medical school and are practicing um, and were such um, wonderful altruistic humans. Um, looking around my class um, when I joined, like there was just so many people who've done so many awe-inspiring things. Um, and I already started feeling this disconnect between their stories and the stories I heard from my family. Um, who access healthcare um, and my community members. And, um, and I didn't quite understand it. And then when I transitioned into clinical work, um, I started to understand the disconnect. Um, and um, in many different ways, um, the nature of um, medicine is based a lot on military teachings, on shame-based teachings. We talk about being in the trenches, 
Um, we talk about how you can't eat when you want or sleep when you want or go to the bathroom when you need to. Um, and so um, as healthcare providers, we start to disconnect from ourselves um, as sort of self-preservation. And with that, um, we start to enter into some pre-burnout phases. Um, and I see my colleagues change um, and go into survival mode. Um, and I also started seeing um, and experiencing uh, racism. And um, both to me, um, to my colleagues, but also um, to patients. Um, and people uh, in both ways that were more microaggressions to full-fledged racism. And I've seen how um, that connect starts to happen between um, these altruistic souls that go into medicine um, and the outcomes that we see when Indigenous people access care. Um, and um, of course, as the Implant Site report highlighted, Indigenous women in particular. Um, and so um, what I, I guess what I took away from that and learning about trauma-informed care practices is that hurt people hurt people. And, um, and for me, going through medical school actually reactivated a lot of my childhood trauma. Um, and there's things that I'm still um, learning um, and healing from. Um, and that um, in order to um, look at system change, we need to look at both sides of the gurney. Um, and in the In Plain Sight report, they um, talk to healthcare workers and their experiences working every day in these um, sometimes very toxic environments and spaces and the toll and impact. Um, and so I'll, I'll touch on a few calls to action, but my first call to action is to say, Yes, we want more Indigenous people um, in healthcare and, and all sorts of roles and responsibilities. And we also have to think about how we're going to care for them in these spaces. And so, um, in particular, a very uh, moving, moving in my life cycle as a woman. <laughs> um, I'm actually nine months pregnant today, so um, pleasure to be here and not in labor quite yet. <laughs> um, and <laughs> Um, and so I'm entering that um, um, motherhood phase um, in a lot of ways and, and starting my ceremony on, on bringing, that, bringing new life into this world and what that means. Um, and so I wanted to focus on um, three kind of calls to action around um, focusing that indigeneity is our strength, um, our culture and our stories and who we are is our strength and colonialism is our deficit. And so, my first thing I wanted to touch on relates to my experience going through medicine and being in medicine, even to this day, that trauma needs to be addressed um, on either side of the gurney um, and to recognize that um, white supremacy is a form of uh, trauma. And so um, in order to actually be anti-racist and to bring anti-racism um, into you know, teachings around cultural safety and humility, we need to encourage people um, to start reflecting on um, whiteness, on, um, on those, um, on what that means. And not, it's not always about learning about indigenous people because um, we all have our own biases um, that impact. Um, and so again, the trauma-informed teaching hurt people, hurt people. Um, we need to be able to look at ourselves and look at what we could be bringing and what we can be contributing. Um, and the second thing, um, we can't change something that we can't measure, which is a very common um, in change management theory and, and quality improvement is something we hear a lot. Um, I can also quote uh, Nadine Corona, she'll let me to say, we need our stories that can't be forgotten, but we need the data that can't be ignored. Um, and in particular, when we look at anti Indigenous racism, when we look at cultural safety and humility training, um, are we asking the right question? Are we evaluating it in the right ways? Um, and, uh, and so that we actually know that call to action that uh, Mary Ellen Pell Lafon mentioned, are we actually making a difference at the point of care? Are we asking that question? And I don't think we are. And 
a, another colleague of mine, Dr. James Makokas, um, in his residency research project titled his paper, Where Our People Go to Die, based on focus groups he held in his community. And that, and that phrase has followed me for my entire career. When I ask a patient that I think is critically ill, that I think he needs to go to the hospital, they'll often say, I don't wanna to go to the hospital because that's where people go to die. Um, and, and so I, uh, the other call to action is to look that we need to be able to measure this well, and we need to be able to show and demonstrate the efforts that do move that needle, that do improve care um, at the bedside. The third thing um, is around colonialism, and colonialism impacts all of us. Um, and in many different ways. Um, and it's perpetuated through racism and patriarchy and white supremacy. Um, and when we look at that, we often like in cultural humility and safety training, we're often um, looking at indigenous people. Um, and what anti-indigenous racism or anti-racism work tells us to do is to turn the mirror around and to start looking and reflecting inwards. And so my last call to action is to say that um, hopefully as non-Indigenous people in Canada start doing that work, it will allow us space as Indigenous people, as Indigenous women to start looking at how colonialism has affected us and our communities and our families um, so that we can be able to start to heal from that on another level. Of course, we've been healing from it forevermore. <laughs> um, but um, I, I really think that when we think about things like lateral violence and, um, and other things that we may see, this idea that there's constant scarcity that, um, that you know, in order for me to succeed, somebody else cannot, um, are things that can be really damaging. Um, and especially as women, uh, we need to be able to hold each other up. Um, and so I think that these conversations are just so important that we need to have so that we can create that future um, that we aspire for. And my last thing, uh, as I move, I'm not, I'm not in the elders, um, I'm not in the elder part of my life cycle yet. So I'll share a story from one of my elders. Um, and it came to me sitting in circle at a time when I just finished residency, I was working in an inner city clinic and I was frankly very angry. I didn't know why I went to med school. I was starting to um, invest more time learning about um, the effects of colonialism as I was seeing it every day in my practice. And I was particularly angry that I couldn't, I didn't seem to have access to or be able to read much about indigenous women's teachings. Um, and so I expressed this in the circle and an elder shared the story with me. Um, she said, you know, before, um, before settlers came, our indigenous women were very wise and some of them could see into the future and they knew change was coming. And um, they knew that our teachings would be at risk. And so they wrapped a sacred bundle and they buried it deep in the earth um, for a time when that could be found and those teachings could be, um, uh, protected and shared in good ways. Um, and at the time, like it really, it touched my heart, but I didn't, I didn't know what it meant. Um, and so being, you know, being from med school, um, I wasn't very metaphorical. So my first lens was, okay, there's a physical bundle somewhere and somebody's going to find it. And then we're going to, you know, move into this new, new realm. And then over the years, I was like, there's probably a bundle representing many teachings across Turtle Island. That's probably what, what she meant. Um, and, and then finally, one day in a different context, somebody said something. They said, nothing given by spirit can ever be lost. And I was like, and it struck me and I was like, oh, I am the bundle. Let's see if I can move here. And she is the bundle. And all of you are the bundle. And sorry. <laughs> and all of you are the bundle. And we and we have good medicine. Um, and we are um, moving women's 
Indigenous women's teachings forward. And so my last and main call to action is just like we would any sacred bundles, we need to remember how to respect and care for ourselves and how to help each other learn how to respect and care for themselves and lift each other up. Thank you. I, I all my relations. Thank you, Dr. Aldred. Just so powerful your words and and just really the bundle that we carry and we that this entire event is about and your participation here and your words are just so powerful. Thank you. Um, I want to call upon another colleague um, who is pretty well known in British Columbia, and that's Leslie Bonshore. Leslie is the vice president at um, uh, Van Coastal Health. And she's been there for a number of years and has recently taken on this more senior leadership role. But she's, um, it's great that we move from talking about bundles and let Leslie come in because Leslie is about building teams and she's about building change and she's about innovation. And um, for a long time, I feel like Leslie sort of just kept in her like lane the work she was doing to protect it from being taken apart. And now she's up in leadership contributing and bringing that knowledge forward. And that's a little bit about like bringing our bundles out to um, have a safe place to do the work. So I'm just so honored that you're with us, Leslie, to, to share your thoughts on this and to also build on what the other speakers have talked about, which is about the sort of moment we're in and the challenge we face. Well, thank you so much, Mary Ellen and, and team and panel and Terry. Oh my God, I'm trying to keep myself together. Um, I actually woke up thinking about you today and wondering if you were going to make it to the circle. <laughs> so I was so happy to see you and thank you for bringing, um, bringing water to the circle too. Um, I want to start off by acknowledging uh, our beautiful elders that work very closely with me and my team, uh, Dr. or Dr. Elder uh, Roberta Price, of course. Um, thank you for, for joining and sharing your kind words. Um, doctor, uh, again, I'm going to give call everybody doctor. Um, Doris Fox, Doris, our elder from Musqueam, who reminds me all the time what my superpower is, which is um, that I am never alone. I know I'm never alone. I am always here speaking on behalf of my grandmother who taught me everything I know, and all of my aunties um, who have been so generous with their knowledge. And when I walk in a room and when I start these conversations, they're with me all the time. So I just wanna honor that as what we bring as women and to this incredible circle of women, I almost feel intimidated by uh, the strength and the power of, of these beautiful indigenous women that you have assembled together. Thank you, Mary Ellen and, and Harmony and Margaret for having this, um, the broad vision to bring us all together to share. I'm going to represent today healthcare, working in regional health authorities, two of them, Fraser Health Authority from 2005 to 2007 as one of their um, external consultants, helping them to see what they're doing and where they can go in response to the transfer of change accord. Um, uh, and then from 2007 to 2015 as their director, started off with the title of project director, moved to director, and then transferred out of there in 2015 to um, another very large health authority called Vancouver Coastal Health with a new vision, a, a fresh new start to say that um, I knew I was going to be able to take a, a system transformation, a business lens to this work and hardwire that indigenous lens to everything we do. That was the language we started to use back then, hardwiring for indigenous cultural safety because we were still too afraid to call it racism in healthcare. I'm thankful for the In Plain Sight report, which allowed us to use this language to say this is the truth telling document that tells us that for, for decades, people were waiting to unleash their stories of their experiences in the healthcare system, not only here in BC, but across this nation, as we heard from the story of Joyce Ekashan, who on that day when her story broke, I felt like I was never ever going to be able to continue working in a health system that continued to treat Indigenous women so poorly. It was the first time ever I felt defeated. 
it didn't last long, thank goodness. And I got back into my hope and my desire to be part of a change and to make things different for, for our Indigenous population as they access healthcare. I always believe that the healthcare system was full of people who do care. Health providers like Dr. Perry and Nadine and Kate and many others, the nurses like Margaret Moss and Tanya Dick, who really are here to heal our people. Cynthia, if you could bring up my, my PowerPoint, I just want to zip through it as quickly as I possibly can just to demonstrate our approach here at Vancouver Coastal Health, um, where I am so happy to be. Um, I, I call myself the self-appointed team captain to this amazing team we've been able to assemble. Next slide. So first and foremost, let me acknowledge who I am. I know you were doing bios in, in the uh, chat box, but I just want to acknowledge that I am Stella. Um, I am from the Shatton First Nation and also the Nooksack Indian tribe. And as we listen to all the comments about the floods and how my Nooksack River is trying to match up back, meet up again with the Sumas Lake, um, I'm reminded of, of the deep, long history between uh, Stella people and the Nooksack. Um, tribes. And I also want to acknowledge I'm calling in today from my home uh, in the Semiama First Nations um, territory, but that our work is conducted at Vancouver Coastal Health in 14 different nations um, across our, our region. Next slide. Part of our work um, in background and context is really in plain sight, I think, uh, for, for so many reasons. Uh, thank Thankfully, Mary Ellen Turpelefon was able to give voice to this. Uh, you and your team did an amazing job. Um, I'm sure you could write version two already. Here we are one year later. Our commitment is to breathe life into this, to, to keep talking about in plain sight. I don't want it to be like other reports that have, you know, splashy uh, releases and then they sit on shelves forever. So we just keep talking about this, like literally every day, this whole team that I'm gonna introduce you to has been asked to keep talking, don't stop talking and creating this speak up culture that um, we're no longer gonna hide uh, the stories, we're gonna keep talking about them. Next slide. So I am honored, of course, to be um, the first ever appointed uh, VP of Indigenous Health. This was an, a deliverable of In Plain Sight. Um, I have to say, I am also thrilled that I am I, I serve under the leadership of Vivian Eliopoulos as our newest CEO as well. Um, just so committed and so gracious and generous with her time and her uh, partnership in this work. And Dr. Penny Ballum, many of you know her, um, different roles that, that Penny has held, but also just bringing to the board two Indigenous leaders, one being Chief Marilyn Slett, who you'll hear from later, and I honestly just don't feel like there's ever been a time when I have felt so dang supported in, in this work, in this role. Um, so being a member of the senior executive team allows me to be a voice at that leadership table before the final stamp is put on anything. Uh, we're able to look at everything through that lens of hardwiring and making sure that we've included the Indigenous voice, um, the Indigenous data. Um, we've been doing this work for, um, uh, a long time, you know, 2005 was the Transform Change Accord where we were supposed to address race or address cultural safety in these systems. And we have tried not only by training our workforce, our 20,000 some employees, but also hardwiring how we make decisions and be inclusive and, and using the devastating data that we've heard about for, for decades to um, make sure that we are keeping that in the forefront. I serve on the um, diversity, equity, inclusion uh, group. I sit on uh, the board of the safety, quality, and performance measuring committee, and also the board governance and HR committee. And I can say that all of that allows me voice, and I am being heard. Next, next slide. So this is this is part of our Indigenous Health team. This is the leadership director team. We've even added a couple more who I'll introduce you to. But this visual, this visual has been shared across our health authority. And this group of Indigenous women and allies have been speaking up. And people have been using words to describe us as powerhouse, which I also heard people say. 
um, today about being using our power. We are strong people and we do hard things. That's what we've been raised to do. Next slide. I want to introduce my um, uh, regional medical director, lead, Dr. Don Wilson, who's from the Health Fit Nation, first ever Indigenous physician to serve on the Health Authority Medical Advisory Committee. He started with us in September. It took about three phone calls, a long conversations to convince him to step into this role. But now he has found his place and his voice. Um, he is with me every time we present to leadership across or the medical leadership across the health authority. And I am so proud to have him as my partner. Next slide. We also have uh, Dr. Toma Timothy. He is our physician advisor for primary care. Uh, Toma is from the Tala Aman Nation. Um, also just so incredible to be able to recruit and bring folks like Toma and Dawn into this work, um, knowing that there's not as many physician, uh, Indigenous physicians out there as we would like. Next slide, I'm introducing our number one ally on our team. Uh, nine out of 10 of our, our directors I'm introducing you to are Indigenous. Uh, Shannon comes to us instead with uh, all her allyship and as a settler with great humility to learn and to lead. She's actually in our interim executive director role for another year while we continue to build up this team. Shannon is mentoring and leading in mental health and substance use, but also um, for, oh God, 20 plus years working in health authorities in Interior, in Alberta, and uh, in Coastal Community Care, Vancouver Coastal Health. And so her operational experience and excellence is being shared with these new directors. Next one. This is Brie Beveridge. Uh, Brie has been with me for about five plus years. She um, started out as a strategic lead. And one of the commitments I've made and, and Vancouver Coastal Health has also uh, agreed as part of our recruitment and retention of Indigenous experts is that for the safety of our Indigenous um, expertise, we want to create advancement opportunities within Indigenous health. I don't want them having to look outside of our system or within our system in, in other departments to, um, to advance their careers. We need to create that within our team. So um, Brie is one of our uh, Aboriginal health strategic leads that has been promoted to a director role over the last uh, six months. And um, she's now expanding her role and her relationship with all of our First Nations throughout the region and partnerships within our system. She's done incredible work engaging, particularly on the vaccine rollout and, and everything COVID for the last several months. Next slide. Oh, Dr. Brittany Bingham. Some of you may recognize her because she has been around for quite some time. Uh, Brittany is breathing life into research and bringing the Indigenous ways of knowing to all things Indigenous research. I believe we're the only um, regional health authority right now that has an Indigenous research team built into our team and connecting with many other partners. In fact, this role that she holds is a partnership with CG She. This is the Center for Gender Sexual Health Equity and really focused on Indigenous women. All things Indigenous women are led by Dr. Brittany Bingham when it comes to research and inclusion. Um, nothing about us without us. How to, how to engage in, real, uh, in research in an authentic way where we are uh, responding to the needs of the Indigenous population. Um, that is what Brittany brings her and her whole team. And she's got an amazing team she's building. We are creating Indigenous learning health systems in real time. So taking the understanding of, of what, the, um, what the data is telling us, um, who was it? Uh, one, of, one of the speakers before me said, data cannot be ignored. You're absolutely right. In health systems, evidence and data drive everything. So if we're not part of that, then we're not driving everything. So that is our commitment. And Dr. Brittany Bingham has been an incredible addition to our team. I've worked with her myself uh, for the last decade. She worked with me at Fraser Health Authority and then came over to Vancouver Coastal Health as well. I am a matriarchal leader. I use matriarchal ways of bringing the young ones along, creating space, 
I was actually so happy to see Serene today. Serene was uh, spent some time with my team uh, before joining her her new her new team now. I love watching these young ones grow into their roles. And we as leaders, as Indigenous women, as we move through the different stages of our life, we have to make space. We have to. That's what my whole role is all about, just making space. Next one, um, this is Tiffany Craig. Tiffany comes to us with incredible skill set in the in, in Indigenous design side of the world. So she has helped us create cultural safety in places and spaces by looking at every single new building that we build to make sure that we're including not only the host nations in the design and the wishes and dreams of the healthcare that's provided, but how we color the buildings, how we build the buildings, what they look like so that when our patients walk in, they feel safe and our workforce, the people that we're trying to attract to work into our health system. Next one. This is Miranda Kelly. Miranda Kelly, my Stella sister, is strengthening and empowering Indigenous women and families. She is our director of Indigenous women and family and actually the, going to be the lead of our newly formed Office of Indigenous Women's Health and Wellness. She is a powerhouse. She is a doula. She is a master's of, of population health. She brings to her years and years of experience, including working with community sales to learning. So <clears throat> she has created an, an incredible Indigenous uh, team. She just brought on two Indigenous doulas, um, Danette and Olivia. She's bringing on an Indigenous midwife very soon. Um, Jesse Dame, who I know is in, in our audience today too, has joined the team as our Indigenous um, strategic lead for all things sexual health. Um, I'm just so impressed with Miranda. What she's been able to do in less than 10 months since joining our team has been phenomenal. Um, her and I just had our quick chat yesterday where, you know, what I take to heart is what Miranda said to me. She said, Leslie, it's because you've been able to create the space for me to do what I want to do. And, and I truly take that to heart. I am clearing the path. My job is to remove the barriers so that Miranda can walk through it and Brittany and everyone else on our team. Next, I'd like to introduce Chris Mullen. Chris started with us November 1st. Um, there aren't many uh, CPACAs Indigenous in this province. I am married to one, so I know this. Um, uh, Chris has joined us as our Director of Strategic Partnerships and Performance. So what that essentially means is he is going to be working internally with the teams that look after our contracts, for example. So we're hardwiring decision making around how we uh, approve contracts to the different proponents that apply to provide services and that we're extending our commitment at Vancouver Coastal Health to all of those partners through these arrangements. So again, we're hardwiring, we're infiltrating, we're changing the way we do business from every decision point possible in our health authority. And then externally, Chris will support advancements of the partnerships that we have with our housing partners like Luma and Atira and others. So um, I'm very excited about Chris's role. <clears throat> he's got a lot of work in front of him, but I know he's up to the challenge. I'd also like to introduce the next one, Lori Quinn. Lori has been working inside Vancouver Coastal Health most recently as the uh, manager of the emergency department of VGH. No small task, I will say. This, this lady has more energy than anyone I've ever met. Um, she has uh, energy to go and deliver on her role as the Director of Indigenous Patient Experience. So someone else mentioned the point of care. That is really Lori's role. So Lori has been working at VGH where we have been um, demonstrating a proof of concept over the last number of years where we have hardwired and brought in and delivered Indigenous cultural safety to cohorts directly on site, on the floor with them, elbow to elbow, teaching, coaching, mentoring, and measuring their impact and the changes as they get this knowledge. Um, Lori is also leading an Indigenous patient experience team that has um, right now three Indigenous patient care clinicians. These are nurses, Indigenous nurses, and she will expand this team. She has our Indigenous patient navigators. Right now she has three of them, I think, we're expanding on those. And what we see is the referrals to this team just 
increasing every day as our Indigenous population understand that we have these folks available um, to support their journey in the healthcare system. We hope that actually this is the perfect intervention to ensure that people have better experiences. We also have two patient quality liaisons with two Indigenous members of our team who sit in the patient quality office and they handle all Indigenous specific complaints to ensure that there's cultural safety on the other end of that phone when you call in to make your complaint uh, with no judgment, with nothing but your best interest at heart. So that's Lori, uh, so fabulous that she joined our team 30 days ago and she has so much work and such a great impact already. Next, I'd like to introduce Janice Wardrop, also um, uh, a long serving member on our team who's just been promoted to Director of Indigenous Cultural Safety and Education. She's from the Squamish Nation, the Kwantlen Nation. She has such a gentle, kind, generous way of teaching cultural safety across our health authority. I look forward to watching Janice grow and grow her team as she continues to serve um, as our educator, as our lead educator and facilitator. And she also is our elder in residence uh, leader as well. So uh, works very closely with elder uh, Roberta and elder Doris. So that's the Dynamo team. They represent and manage about 38 other members of our team. Um, not trying to create some sort of powerhouse uh, empire building inside the health authority. What I'm trying to do is ensure that we have the indigenous leadership we require to implement the changes we're looking to do. Not only the calls to action of in plain sight, but also all of the truth and reconciliation calls to action. Every report, including the murdered and missing indigenous women's recommendation and calls to action. Um, this, is the, this is the approach that we've had here in Vancouver Coastal Health. And I wanna say, you can stop sharing now, Cynthia. I just wanna say that along with recruiting and attracting indigenous expertise in this area, we have to create safety. I've heard this mentioned from the other panelists and the one, the panel before us. I can say I have done a, a lot of work for myself to ensure I protect my little heart when I go to work. It's not always safe. I don't always feel great about it, but I know that if I can keep using generosity, kindness, and sharing of knowledge and making space for these conversations, that others are coming along. I can say I have a lot of friends inside the health system and I am thankful for them. They know that they have a role to play in this and I believe that we need to keep inspiring hope and we have to keep asking for the help. We are not here, this team, this Indigenous health team in Vancouver Coastal Health is not here to do all the work. We're here to help activate $4.1 billion of spending senior executive members, board members, 22,000 plus staff and medical staff to help them to understand why, to do the work better in a safer, more meaningful way and to make space, make space for us. We're here and we're not going anywhere. We're gonna grow. So thank you, Mary Ellen. Thank you for allowing me to share, I hope some inspiration of what can happen in health authorities. I look forward to continuing to hold the system to account by reporting and, and continuing to measure how we do. Um, but yeah, that's our commitment. And I, I just wanna say, uh, let's be kind with, to each other as we do this work, because it's not easy. And for everybody who is participating, I know there's 500 some odd people, stop for a moment and thank people like Terry. Thank people like Dawn and Kate and Nadine and Mary Ellen and Harmony, and I could go on and on. They're here representing so many, right? We're given Thank voice you. Thank, Thank you, you, Leslie. Thank you so much. Like you're, it's like amazing to see a team, right? And the team coordinated and working and inspiration and building and having to overcome obstacles and work together is important and our next um, panelist our final panelist for this session is don thomas who's from sanamuk and is 
the, the most senior leader, which in, in British Columbia, she's the most senior indigenous person in the government of British Columbia, which in and of itself sounds like a curse actually, <laughs> but I completely stand up her work and her leadership. Um, I know Dr. Nadine Caron has to leave um, our session. She's actually just said goodbye to everyone as well, because I know we're running a little bit late. So I just want to make sure we get to say thank you to her before she goes and to keep up her amazing, inspiring work. But I'm really delighted that Dawn's here and gets to have some of the sort of final comments on this panel about the work that she's doing and the challenge that, um, you know, rests ahead for Indigenous women. So over to you, Dawn. Thank you so much. I uh, really appreciate that. And as uh, others have said, really honored and really humbled to be here today uh, to uh, speak to some of these issues. And I want to raise my hands to uh, Mary Ellen and uh, Harmony and uh, those that have put this uh, group together. It is inspiring and hopeful, uh, and we need that hope uh, at the end of the day uh, to uh, hear from all these uh, amazing women leaders, uh, Indigenous women leaders. So thank you. I do want to raise my hands to dear Elda Roberta. Uh, thank you for opening us up in a good way to Elder for us as well. Elder Roberta is an elder on our task team and provides a lot of guidance and support. And always grateful uh, to see her and hear from her. So thank, you both, thank, you. thank you to both elders for opening us up in a good way. I am calling you today from the traditional territory in the form of people uh, known as uh, Songs and Swarmal First Nations. Um, I am from the Sumimo First Nation with family ties to the Toronto, but I have the Toronto name that I just want to quickly share with you. It's Ka'afwa'i, and that loosely translates to the one who says the right words about chiefly business. And I received my name from a matriarch in my community, and the Toronto family, my late auntie Hilda, who is an amazing, strong uh, leader, and I think of her uh, in my life. So really happy uh, to be here. And first, before I go into too much, I want to give a bit of an update on Inkling site, and I can talk a little bit about the challenges uh, and some of the provincial work that's happening. But I always like to start with really raising my hands up and thanking all the women uh, that came forward and all the uh, uh, groups that came forward to share their stories in Inkling site. So, as many said, not the first time uh, that those stories have been shared and the courage it takes uh, for women um, uh, and our community members to come forward to share those uh, again and again. Um, uh, just want to raise my hands and acknowledge that. And I think of those stories in our work and as we're trying to make the change within the system. It, uh, I will say we're not where we probably wanted to be as we look at the one year anniversary uh, with some of this work. It's uh, taking more time than I think we uh, initially thought it would take to move forward on some of the recommendations. I do want to acknowledge uh, Dr. Kate Elliott as my co-chair on task team uh, and uh, uh, Richard Dock uh, from First Nations Health Authorities, the other co-chair on the group. It's a large community task force and we've been working on building relationship um, and coming together with a diverse group of people with diverse agendas. And so, um, what task team has come up with is a working group um, process, I guess, uh, uh, implementing a number of working groups to start looking at the recommendations specifically. And so um, I just want to quickly go through a few of those working groups. So we prioritize the legislative working group because of some of the uh, legislative uh, planning that the government is doing around spring changes to legislation. And so the other reason that was important is because of accountability. So Mary Ellen and her team found that there was basically zero accountability in the healthcare system. And although we will work on cultural safety, humility, and training, that won't change the hearts and minds of everybody in our system. And so we need to have legislative and policy uh, uh, pieces of work done so that we can hold people accountable in the system. And I think I saw a comment on that uh, in the Q&A around how do we hold people accountable when these things happen, when either you witness or experience racism in the system. Um, and it does continue to happen today. And Marielle's question about, has anything changed at the point of care? Um, I don't think a lot has changed at the point of care, to be quite honest with you. There is so much work to do and the change is so transformative that it's gonna take time for it to reach that point of care. And I feel a sense of urgency. I often think of a story that was shared with me where um, a health director um, was at the hospital and noticed a community member in the car. The community member had been in the car for two hours, needed emergency care, but was trying to talk themselves into going into the emergency room because they were worried about their racism they would experience in the hospital. 
two hours, and thankfully the health director was there and able to take the person into emergency. And, and that person did not receive great care, even with the health director with them. And so I do think of those stories when we're talking about urgency and that point of care and making the changes that we need to, but we're not there yet. I wanna be uh, honest about that uh, uh, as we go forward. There is a point of care working group that's gonna to come together to look at some of the issues and what are the strategies we can use to ensure that some of these changes are happening at that level. And I know there's some good work happening uh, uh, in small pockets across the province around uh, this piece around point of care. We also have a complaints working group. It's the number one issue that I come across in community uh, or meeting with chiefs and leaders um, is complaints. And uh, Mary Ellen's right. Uh, I know she said she continues to receive them. We continue to receive them. A uh, significant amount of issues around racism, uh, for particularly women, but all Indigenous people who are trying to access health care. There is some work being done regionally, um, and, I, and I'll say uh, Island Health and the Fraser Region are both doing some work uh, specifically around complaints that I think we can learn from. Um, there, I want to share a quick story uh, in Island Health. Uh, there was a egregious situation in a small community and a loss of a young person, and I don't want to give too many details, uh, but uh, the health authority leadership actually went to community and participated in a traditional apology. And so we're hoping to have more restorative processes and approaches to complaints like that. And I'm not giving the story enough uh, a background or context, but just to say the learning from that situation was so significant for this leadership at the health authority, much more than any um, training that I've ever participated in or that they had participated in. The family had so much grace. They just wanted to sit in circle with the leadership to talk about their experience and the loss of this community, young community member uh, and what that was like. And then the family had recommendations to go forward um, and what they felt would help uh, mend the relationship uh, and um, mend, uh, you know, eradicate some of the racism uh, in that community. And so I'm hoping we can learn on and build on from some of those processes that are in place and go back to our uh, traditional ways of managing conflict uh, or complaints. But it's a significant issue uh, that we need to do much more work on. There will be a provincial gathering in January uh, of leaders around this complaints process getting a sense of what's happening across the system, where do we need to make changes, um, and approaching it from a multidisciplinary type of uh, approach. So looking forward to that. So the three working groups that are up and running are legislation, complaints, and point of care. Those were identified as the highest priority areas. Um, and uh, we have seen some success in that working group model, and so I want to continue to support that uh, going forward. There are three other working groups that are pending, uh, cultural safety and humility and education, communications and engagement, and then what people have talked about quite a bit today around data and measurement. Uh, so those will be uh, upcoming. Um, I, I do want to, um, for those of you that I've presented in front of before, you know uh, that my passion is Indigenous recruitment and retention and the Inflame Site Report did uh, recommend uh, this position that Mary Ellen uh, just mentioned that I'm currently in. And I do raise my hands to Mary Ellen for uh, uh, recommending this position and also supporting a woman, uh, First Nations Indigenous woman into this position. I think it's an important message to give, but I am the only Associate Deputy Minister that's Indigenous in the uh, public service. And so one of my calls to action is that we demand better in the BC public service because health and wellness just is an administrative health issue. As you're well aware, uh, it overlaps in other ministries. And so we need Indigenous women in those leadership roles as well. Uh, in 2021, uh, we need to do better. Uh, there's zero Indigenous deputy ministers, and I think two or three assistant deputy ministers. We meet as a group, uh, also with Dr. Danielle Van Smith, to talk about the changes that we need system wide. And uh, I look forward to that continued work uh, along the way. But something that someone had said in the panel, and I think it was Terry, um, sorry, um, and I know Leslie, you touched on it too, is around recruitment is important, but retention is almost more important. So that when we get our Indigenous leaders in these positions, the systems are able to accept them. And um, if, when that doesn't happen, it often looks like it's a failure of the Indigenous leader that has not done well, but it's actually the system that has failed the leader. And so, um, 
I, I don't feel like we're there yet. We're starting to build some systems and supports around our Indigenous leaders, but we need to have a much more focused effort in that area so that when we do bring people into these systems that we're supporting. I'll say creating a team at the Ministry of Health, uh, I've been um, given some flexibility on who uh, to bring into the organization here. Uh, and I'm really grateful for that and the leadership of uh, Stephen Brown, the deputy. But it's been difficult for the Indigenous staff that have come on board, uh, Indigenous leaders, around some of that pushback that they get within the system. Some of, one of the barriers um, around this piece, around recruitment retention, around the recommendations, is that the system wasn't necessarily ready for the recommendations. So Larry Allen's report came in. It was it like gives us a framework on how to move forward. But we're in a colonial system. And an elder had said to me, you need to make some changes internally to be able to accept the recommendations fully and implement them. Otherwise, they won't be sustain, sustainable or meaningful. And we've really taken that to heart to, to start to make some changes at the Ministry of Health to be able to accept Indigenous recruitment and retention, to be able to accept a different complaints process. Um, all that work that we need to do, and what we call it on our team is cleaning up our own house. <laughs> we need to do some cleaning internally before we go too far out. It's been fascinating to watch that unfold because I think what's happening internally in a small way for my team is going to be what's happening in the health authorities as we go out uh, and demand some of these changes that are necessary. So the pushback, um, the questions about Indigenous staff's integrity because they raise these issues, like a fascinating uh, a situation that we find ourselves in. And I would love a grad student to come and do some work on this, uh, but we do need to do that internal foundational work at the Ministry of Health so that we can then go out in a more confident way uh, around some of these recommendations uh, as we move forward. So as we come up on the year uh, anniversary, we are looking for a public report uh, at the end of this year. So uh, January 2022, task team will be working together uh, to develop that and be able to better report out on where we're at uh, with the recommendations. Um, but to say that, um, uh, we've spent time building trust and relationship in our in community around this work, doing some internal work, and then moving forward on some recommendations that we're able to. I do feel confident in the next year we'll be able to see greater change than we've perhaps seen in this past year. Um, and um, I'm looking forward to working with uh, the women in this group and uh, this panel uh, and the leaders to help uh, implement that change. And something that Dr. Nadine Karen said that I really think is important, that we come together as Indigenous women and support each other to move this forward. We're not going to be able to do it unless uh, we do that and, and not bring each other down, uh, not compete, uh, that we come together as one group uh, to make the necessary changes. We do feel the urgency uh, and, and we need to balance that out with the transformational change that's required uh, in the community. So, end there quickly. Uh, we have some wonderful speakers in the next uh, panel. So really appreciate everybody's time and raise my hands to all of you who are doing this good work. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dawn. And uh, really, again, thank you to the all of the panelists. And as I say, Dr. Caron had to leave. But um, this is really talking about a work in progress. Uh, but you know, the leadership by Indigenous women across systems at every single level is remarkable and it's it's you know frankly not enough like i mean um, not to put more pressure on everyone here but it's um you know it's modeling something that's really important which is about collaborative cooperative and supportive change and i really just want to stand you up and recognize you in particular dawn because when you have those leadership roles the pressure is immense especially when you're stepping into a system that has never had indigenous women at that level the demands are ridiculous, I'm sure. <laughs> but um, you certainly um, have much support to reach out to everyone here to keep keep up with the good work. So thank you. I've been trying to um, uh, answer some of the questions in the chat. I apologize if we've just had so many, we haven't answered all of them. And some of them, some of our panelists will have a chance to get back to, but we won't have much time for Q's and A's with this panel because as Don indicated, we want to move forward with the next panel, and I want to make sure you can hear for, hear from those three speakers. And uh, Dr. Margaret Moss is uh, going to chair the next panel, so I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Moss. 
Thank you, Mary Ellen. Okay, so this third and last panel um, will reflect upon requirements to support success of Indigenous women. And some of the things we will query are what are the key barriers Indigenous women face in healthcare leadership? Uh, how do we know we're successful? And then where are collaborations occurring, where connections are missing and why? So I believe we have four people on this panel, so it's a little shorter. And we will start, sorry, so I took my page, with Dr. Uh, Shannon Waters. Um, she, and I will let people say their own nations. I, I don't want to mess it up. So anyway, she's Coast Salish and a member of a First Nations on uh, uh, a First Nation on Vancouver Island. She initially worked in her home territory as a family duck, and then is com and then completed her specialty training in public health and preventive medicine. And I believe she's stated she's come full circle and uh, working in her home territory as the local medical health officer um, with Island Health. So I'll stop there so we can hear from you. Hi, Nate. Good morning. Uh, I It's nice to see all of you. Uh, I want to just acknowledge uh, being on this amazing panel within this amazing circle. I want to um, acknowledge and thank the elders for opening uh, Doris Fox and my relative, Roberta Price. Uh, so great to um, have you open us up this morning. And I am uh, zooming in from my home territory I am from Stamanis First Nation, a Halkmeetnam woman, and also a member of, um, I also have many family ties to Kalachin tribes as well. So I was just going to share a bit of time and a bit of uh, some of my story with regards to how leadership has interfaced with the work I've done over my time within the health system. So I graduated with my second specialty, public health and preventative medicine, at a time when there was a real ability to own my, uh, hone my leadership skills. Uh, it was in the midst of H1N1, many of you may remember that time. And it was also at the time when we were working to build a new First Nations Health Authority, a health entity here within British Columbia. Uh, so not long, just weeks into having my role, I was you know, chairing provincial level meetings feeling kind of terrified, but some of you on this uh, uh, circle today were in some of those meetings and we were trying to forge a way working with partners to uh, really reduce the impact of this communicable disease within our peoples, which is, you know, here we are, you know, a number of years later looking at COVID. And so I had many opportunities and experiences that it would probably have taken me years to uh, um, you know, have otherwise because we were in this time of uh, uh, H1N1. And I, uh, as I was gaining some of these leadership skills, I began to feel that my leadership was attached to a position that I held within a role or, or to a title I held within an organization. And what I realized over time is a lot of these organizations are, are within racist and patriarchal systems. And even though there's lots of times where like really good work is being done, there's lots of really good people who are working within these health systems, there are also really difficult times we come across. And um, you know, some of those really difficult times um, it can cause pain and are directly attached to sometimes the fact that some of us here on this panel are and within this circle identify as as women. Uh, many of us here within this circle have been in many different roles at different organizations over the course of our careers and sometimes that changing of those careers is not necessarily something we'd planned for or hoped for. But um, I had such a situation and it was a very difficult and painful time for me. And I reached out to many within my support network at that time. And I was so grateful for all those different people. I was the major breadwinner within my family at that time. We had just moved to back to my home territory. And one of my friends and mentors suggested, you know, look at your ancestral stories. And I had, you know, uh, immersed myself in them before, but I went back and took a look. And our ancestral story as Couch and people is called Those Who Fall from the Sky. And within the versions of the story that I was immersing myself within, 
that the first people who fell from the sky were uh, men and the first woman walked across the land to the Cowichan Valley to meet them and become the Cowichan people. There was a lot of details about the men's story, where they walked, things that they had learned, and there was very little detail about the woman. And I found myself getting a bit angry about that. And I talked to different people about that and was sitting there with that and, uh, you know, had a number of things, ideas come to me around that. First, that, you know, probably in a lot of these versions of stories that were recorded often by white anthropologists back in the day, they either didn't search out women, or they were only talking to men, um, and they didn't even record the woman's part of the story, or maybe um, the men that they talked to knew the woman's story wasn't their part to tell, so they didn't tell that story. Or one day I was sitting there thinking, or oh, maybe this was an invitation from my ancestors to actually walk that journey myself and make it my own. And once I thought of that, I couldn't actually like unsee it. And I actually just typed in on Google map how to walk from South to Cowichan. And lo and behold, there was like a little walking path that came before my eyes. And I, I talked to a sister friend and we found ourselves planning to make this journey, um, speaking with other, um, you know, friends and contacts and connecting to Sioux First Nation and talking to people here in Cowichan as well, you know, mapping things out, getting things ready. And finally, in, in, in the summer, we decided to, to, you know, pick the day where we were starting this journey. And it was quite a, a journey. I actually, um, me and my husband were trying to uh, conceive our second child and I thought perhaps make, doing this journey would, would help with that and I actually became pregnant in the planning for the journey so I was 11 weeks pregnant when we were doing this walk which was made it a little bit more challenging especially walking in the heat and um, and we were slower me and my sister friend that than we originally thought and I, I thought a lot about the ancestors because I had uh, ideas that they did this journey in this superhuman amount of time I had ideas that they weren't scared or worried or fearful when they were making this journey to start a, to start a new life. And I realized that, you know, as I was doing the walk, I was scared. There was times when we were in a tent at night that I was hearing, I don't know what kind of animal. And I was, you know, looking at my friends saying, are you sleeping? No, I'm not sleeping. Um, but it really made me realize through doing this walk, my ancestors were there with me and they were real people having struggles and challenges and times of strength like I was. And it really helped me realize that my leadership was actually the journey I take through my lifetime, that it wasn't attached to a title or an organization. And uh, when I finished the walk, I, I realized that, you know, coming out of that, I had really been immersed in a colonial mindset in, in the institutions and organizations that I was working within, that there was limited seats at leadership tables that were defined by systems that I wasn't familiar with. And that actually put me in competition with others, sometimes other indigenous women to be at those tables. And I realized through taking this journey that really it's not about those tables of leadership I hold is always within me. It can't be taken away because now I've actually been able to have the experience to make my ancestral story my own. Well, we were taking that journey, walking over five days and four nights. Uh, what we realized is we were actually, as we had mapped it by computer, we actually realized we were following the path of water. We were following the rivers. We got to the Souk Lake. We went over to Coke Island, we followed, we followed the water um, into Cowichan. Uh, that was the path that came up before us. It was also very practical to have water, you know, close by at all times. We spent a day where we immersed and just swam and played in um, some of the streams. But it was also a summer, uh, as we've had many lately, of extreme drought and wildfires and wildfire risk. And being immersed in my home territory also made me realize that, you know, this, this, this healing journey I was taking, this, the ecosystem, Mother Earth is 
the health system. It's the foundational health system that, you know, also we have decreasing and sometimes impaired access to as, um, you know, any peoples, Indigenous peoples, Indigenous women as well. And so I really felt strongly that that was something else I wanted to take forward and really looking at, particularly in my role in public health and preventative medicine. So I'm not seeing individual clients um, as, a, as, a, as a physician anymore. I'm working at the population and systems level. And so I really felt strongly that we needed to, you know, have this more inclusive, holistic look at what actually is, you know, there to support our health and wellness. So, you know, within this panel and this circle here today, I, I know there's others, women and, and um, people, uh, you know, throughout working in this sphere and those in, you know, identifying in different places within the gender spectrum that we're able to work together in, you know, this common purpose. I've had the opportunity to work with many women who are on this panel with some I've seen providing comments in the circles. And I miss having, you know, the, the time. I wish I could work more with all of you. And it's so nice to be here on this, on this, you know, in this space here today. And, you know, really it's artificial divides. It's artificial divides, the different organizations and places and spaces that we work within. I just think of, you know, this energy here today, like what would be the potential if we just kind of put those artificial divides aside and really looked at the potential and the imperative and the urgency that we really have to really try to transform what we, uh, what we need to do in this time. And so I think, you know, one of my calls to action is really like, what can we, what can we put forward as our collective vision of how the health system actually needs to be valued and acknowledged in a different way. And I'll just end with one story around, um, you know, how do we know if we're doing this? How do we know if we're doing well? A vision that really of, of health that really speaks close to my heart that I've worked with over time is probably familiar to some of you, but this is the First Nations perspective on health and wellness. And it's a number of concentral circles with the human being in the center and different colors. And then there's people depicted all around the outside, all holding hands. And I was speaking at a conference a number of years ago when my oldest daughter was then four. And she came up to me and she said, mommy, mommy, like, where's that picture you have with me in it? And I was like, what are you talking about? And, you know, she would say it again. And finally, she saw some of my... Um, speaking notes and slides and she said oh there it is mom and she pointed to the, the depiction of the first nations perspective on health and wellness that i was speaking to you know is how we were looking at creating the health system in the future and she pointed to a little person at the top of the circle and she said mom there's me and then you there's you and there's dad holding my hands and i just had to take a really deep breath and i was like whoa you know this is really hard work. And sometimes it's really overwhelming. But like if a four-year-old girl can see herself in the picture of how we're changing this, I really think we're on the right track. So with that, I wanna say hi Sapka, thank you, oh respected ones. And um, it's been a really pleasure to share a few words with you today. Thank you so much for that. And that last story, that's just wonderful. I, I think that that should be shared all over. That's just great. Um, thank you so much. Uh, next is Lauren Brown. Again, I'm skipping over. I don't want to massacre any. Anyway, she's a health director. She's a nurse and has her MA. She's from the Haida Nation. She advocates for improving uh, Aboriginal health and has experience in policy and program development, teaching, and government relations. And I'll leave it there. Take it away. Lauren. Koa Dr. Moss. Kuljakanga, Kilslaikanga, Dilta Hulan Koyasis, Yahuga Yuans Hanu de Kigaga, Kayathlanis Adu de Kigawaga, Asi at the lung sting stoutagi, the lung gathal kilt law, a hayek in a Yuan gustal digan. And I opened with ladies held in high esteem as our nation addresses our women first and foremost in that way. And then I address all the chiefs. My name is Lauren Brown. I'm the health director of the Skidigat Health Center. 
I was born into the Joth Eagle clan. Thank you all for being here. Today is a great day. I might add Ke Gusingai Gunan La to the one year birthday of this important work. Finally, I felt seen, I felt heard, and I want to extend my gratitude to Mary Ellen and her team, Harmony, and also extend that out to our minister, Adrian Dix, who held account what was being displayed on media of the atrocities and of what we've all known was happening to our people in the healthcare system. So with that, I have a presentation um, talking about challenges. I've had many challenges in my health career, many working in your own community, uh, being in leadership positions, we get the hits. But this is one challenge I'm not sure I'll be able to make. Being getting through this in 10 minutes, I'll do my best. Skana Jelts Pedas Haida is the female supernatural beings of Haida Gwai, from racism and healthcare to empowerment of our Indigenous women. Um, so, how does knowing our female supernatural beings support us, Indigenous women? If you all recall the uh, Wonder Woman movie that came out for the greater audience, had a few years ago, it had eight, it had 800 million views. Our woman, our, our indigenous woman, all women across the world want to know more about these beings, these female beings who have superpowers. In Haida Gwaii, we have our female supernatural beings who are half woman and half element, half animal, and whatever that woman takes on in her female supernatural power, brings the gifts. Supernatural being um, half rock woman, she's this power, sits in the corner of the longhouse, she doesn't speak, and she just listens, and she observes everything, she records everything, and that's our supernatural being who is called half rock woman. Often, I find these roles are lost in our current society where we have these record keepers who keep track of everything of that's happening. It's shifting, but it's happening today as we're witnessing. Um, so just like Wonder Woman, our supernatural female beings are starting to be brought forward in our nation. Um, I have to attribute it to Terry Lynn Davidson, our Haida woman. Her Haida name is Gita Thutzlie. And she brought forward our female supernatural beings in a book called Out of Concealment in 2017. So much of my knowledge and work is from that, but also a Waganat, Diane Brown, my mother, who is a fluent speaker, who has a deep connection to the knowing and the wisdom of our female supernatural beings. Um, so these female supernatural beings bring our humanity forward. My mom, Waganat, quoted Nankinga Yuans, a late storyteller, who also who said that if it weren't for this female supernatural beings, we wouldn't be here for they took pity on us and helped show us the way at the beginning of time. They remind us of our potential of our female sacred feminine of who we are connecting us all women deeply to our inherent rights to be sovereign. The next slide please. When we approached our elders to ask for a word for reconciliation, there wasn't a word, but what they came up with, Kelkiata, Betty Richardson said, this term would reflect what we're trying to achieve in our Haida language, which is I will never again feel that I'm less than. Coloni the colonizers arrived here to this land where there was societies built that were indigenous inherent to the lands. What they didn't know was that they arrived to a land where indigenous women held roles. They held many roles that were different from the Euro European countries that they came from. Our indigenous women held sacred positions in our societies and in our communities. Knowledge keeper, wisdom keeper, boss woman, cool job woman who our clan and our people look to for guidance and support. Next slide, please. And I'm not gonna go into this because we spent all morning, but what I will say here is that um, these colonizers try to tell us who we are. They try to tell us that we don't have a voice and that our words and our thoughts don't matter. And through colonization, we became oppressed and suppressed as females in our societies and in our communities. And they also told us we didn't matter. 
and they thought we can be used and abused sexually and in ways that have impacted all of our women and our, therefore our communities. When our women are impacted by disparities of healthcare, we're talking about whole system, whole communities, breakdowns in our communities. Next slide, please. Oh. Oh, so, sorry, yes. So what I wanted to say that as women, we must prepare our children and future generations to enjoy a life lived free from this oppression that we find ourselves in. But to get there, every one of us now must take 100% responsibility for the conditions we find ourselves in, in our lives and heal the traumas of our past. So what, I, what I'm saying is the filters that we all come forward with for myself, is, um, and I think for all of us, is our lived experience as Indigenous people moving through a system that oppresses and suppresses us. We come forward with a filter that is filled with ways of being that impose on us racism and how we're meant to be treated. So with this, we need to start taking responsibility to shift, shift these filters and reclaim our power in these systems. And the next slide, please. Kuljat Gonga is a term that we use to hold our women high esteem. In spite of what was imposed, we must not let the colonial systems and people continue to define who we are. We need to stand up for ourselves. We, we are empowered. We are respected. We are wise. We are consulted. We are held in high regard. We matter. We are seen and we are heard. And the next slide. So the Female Supernatural Being Project um, is based on a trip that I took in 2019 to New Zealand. We went to a marae and there was this powerful, a bluff was the English term, it's Te Aroha Marae. And they had their, their female and Maori ancestors carved in eight and nine foot powerful woman that was their female ancestors. And I deeply connected to them because I, connected to our female, female supernatural beings on Haida Gwaii. So I came back and uh, in alignment with a, a new wellness center being built here in Skidigit, I had the vision to bring our female supernatural beings forward and to be carved in a way that generations of our Haida people can connect, touch and see our female supernatural beings in, of Haida Gwaii. And this is a quote out of Auto Concealment, Gidalfutzlie, Terry Lynn. Female supernatural beings are inherently sensual and sexual. In traditional Haida culture and in many indigenous cultures, female power is intrinsic to healthy sexuality. Christianity suppressed indigenous feminine power and sexuality. I share the view that suppression of sexuality throughout colonial history is related to violence against women. And that's a quote from Terry Lynn Davidson. Next slide, please. Waganat said, our female supernatural beings have been here since the beginning of time and they're still here. Some are feared, some are revered. To date, the Skidigit Haida language program has documented over 500 supernatural beings. There, there is male, but, but um, for the project and for Terry Lynn's book, it's been a focus of female because they are so present in our beginning of time. Next slide, please. Wade Davis um, did the foreword for Gideth Gutzlier's book, Out of Concealment, and this is what he said. Not artifacts of the past, but as poetry to be reimagined as prayers for new generations of Haida, free and empowered at last to chart their own way forward. And the picture here is the mask of uh, Skulujat. She's a female supernatural being, our female beginning ancestor woman. Um, she has 10 breasts, she's powerful. She has lasers in her eyes. She's, she's incredible. I have a lot of respect for her. And the next slide, please. Uh, here is a Haida model of health service delivery. And this is based on, in 2016, we developed a Haida model of health governance. We pulled away from the Indian Act, the Band Council. We're not under the Skidigit Band Council. We have our own um, board. And it's reflective of our Haida clan system, our governance model. And so bringing through, threading through, how can we translate this into service delivery is the Haida model of health service delivery that 
I did in my master's project and it's based on the Haida moon. It's a relevant recurring theme for us is our connection to feminine through the moon. And this is a, the Haida model of health service delivery. And the moon is the depiction. It's reflective of our four Haida laws of yakudang, pul yata, inawadlan gudok fwaget, atkyanang plagan. And the bottom is woman. The bottom is a female woman. And this my song my mom used to sing to my daughters. Um, I'll spare you all. I will not sing it. Uh, <laughs> I did not get um, the gift of voice. But their translation is the moon shatters an eagle woman pick up the pieces of the moon. The pieces of the moon are colonization and residential school colonial policy. And the eagle woman are all our healthcare workers who work tirelessly picking up the traumas of our past who work so hard to the point of burnout and exhaustion. And, and it's expected of them. And I'm gonna ask to go on to the next slide. I know I'm rushing, I'm sorry. This is the female supernatural vision that I carried through from um, New Zealand in 2019, where um, eight cedar sculptures of Haida female supernatural beings will be carved and placed throughout our new wellness center. The intention is to convey Haida origin and oral traditions to empower generations of our Haida to reach their highest level of wellness, helping to restore strong minds and cultural well-being. The selection of the supernatural beings align with the Haida model of health service delivery and are representative of our Haida realms. And now is the fun. I love, love the next slides because I'm gonna be introducing to you quickly. The stories are long, um, the, the female supernaturals that will be carved. And the next slide, please, Cynthia. There we go. So um, Gila Kunz to the left, she's an ancestor of Haida people who are Eagle lineage. She is a direct descendant of myself who is Eagle. And Gila Kunz demonstrates Yatta, making it right, correcting actions that are disrespectful. She appears throughout Haida narratives. She married Raven and had 10 children, five Eagle, five Raven. She, shows, she showed us medicines and she, she stands at the creek She's at every creek that the salmon returned to. There's so much love for her that the salmon returned to her and it is her they returned to. And the next um, origin is our school Ujot. She's a foam woman and she's the one with the 10 breasts and she's an ancestor of the raven lineage of our people. She emerged out of the ocean at, at Khagya Skin Cuddle Inlet onto a reef after the flood she brought forth Haida people from foam created from protein in the water, showing that we are interconnected and thereby demonstrating everything depends on everything else. Skulujad sat on the reef and all the supernatural beings were trying to climb up. There was no land. And this powerful female being was so powerful that she looked, she would look around and her eyes were lasers and they laser them off the rock. One female supernatural being she allowed onto the rock and that was um, Kuganjat, mouse woman. And every time she lasered her, she got smaller and smaller and smaller until she became the size she is today. Um, and mouse woman is powerful. She's tiny, but mighty. She carries the medicine and Skulujat rightly so let her climb on the rock and she helped her in, in our stories. The next slide, please. Um, yeah, so I've already went over the origins of Haida people and oh, I hope I have time. I'm going to skip over number three, Koya Gyagendal, because I want to loop back. Um, another super female supernatural being that will be carved is uh, Skalangana, the singer, which is from the eagle lineage. And of the land, Kuganjot was chosen to align with the medicine and with health care. And Tsukwaika is older cedar woman, and she's a powerful female supernatural being and our connection to cedar and through her gifts of cedar come through where cedar is so important to our people, um, housing us and canoes and paddles. And the other land female supernatural being to be depicted is, is half rock woman. I introduced you to her 
where she's the record keeper and she silently sits in the corner of the longhouse and, and she's powerful and quiet. And um, the water, the, from, the la from the water, we have Gila Kuntz, who I talked about, Foam Woman, School of Jot. And also we are, gonna be, we are going to honor and depict Chi Hu Jing Jot, Low Tide Woman. And she's powerful in, in the artist depiction. It's incredible. There's, there's all the foods that we love and harvest hanging off of her. There's scallops and abalone and gudunai, the, the sea urchin. And the next slide, if I have time, I'm going to share. Koya Gagandal is sacred one standing and moving. And could you believe this story? Um, Koya Gagandal won the rights to hold up Haida Gwaii. He's, that's his rights. He's honored to have Haida Gwaii on his chest. So laying on the bottom of the ocean is Koya Gagandal and there's a beam of light going up to the center of Haida Gwaii. And he's holding up Haida Gwaii. I had a tough time. We all have our tough times, especially those of us who work and live in our own communities. It's our own people that often really make it hard, our, our work and really our biggest lessons. And I was having a hard time. There was many this past year with COVID. And I, I asked for help from this gifted healer who doesn't know anything about our female, our supernatural beings. And she, uh, she surprised me with her request and it was, who would you like to bring forward? And I just thought, I need balance in my life. I would like to bring forward Koya Gagandal. And that's all I said to her. She hung up, does her work, came back to me and said, oh, I had the most amazing session with this Koya Gagandal. I said to him, I'm bringing forward my sister. She's tired. She's tired. She's been working in healthcare. And he looked at her and said, are you kidding me? I'm holding up Heidi Gwai and she's tired? Boy, was I shifted. And this is to all of you on this panel and to all of you listening, all of all of us who are working in the, in the ditches, grunting along, doing the belly crawl for our people. It, it's, it's shifted me for sure, gave me life and allowed me to continue some of the work that I'm doing. And so love this teaching. Also, Koya Gagandal, when he moves, is the earthquake. Sorry, was there someone on the mic? No, this, thank you. That was wonderful. I loved uh, hearing about the uh, supernatural beings of Haida Gwaii. That's fascinating. Thank you so yeah. much. I know we're running a little short, so we, I will quickly say the last two, and when they will bring us out, and then we'll have a, a closing. So uh, Tanya Dick is an uh, adjunct professor colleague of mine at the University of uh, British Columbia School of Nursing, hails from, I'm sorry, <laughs> First Nations of Kingcom Inlet, and has been a registered nurse in British Columbia for 12 years. Her entire career has been spent in rural and remote nursing. And then we have Chief Marilyn Sweat, is a, a citizen of the Hellsuit Nation and elected chief counselor of the tribal council. She's currently serving her fourth consecutive term as chief counselor beginning in 2008 and as president of Coast, uh, Coastal First Nations Great Bear Initiative and is a member of Vancouver Coastal Health Board of Directors. So we'll start with Tanya and we'll close it out with Chief Marilyn Slip. Thank you, thanks. Um, my traditional name is Mahologwa, I'm Tanya Dick. I'm from the Zaurano First Nation of Kinkam Inlet. Um, I'm a registered nurse. I've been in nursing actually for 18 years now. Um, I think I had one job was to look over the bio and I didn't respond in time, I guess. But yeah, I've been doing this work for a long time. Did my master's in the nurse practitioner program, graduated in 2010. Um, I think just the role of a nurse in, in my own community, my father or my mother's reserve, uh, regardless of where I was working, it really catapulted me into these leadership roles I guess within family and community and constantly kind of getting calls and um from people you know from family from nieces nephews aunts and uncles just to kind of help out with whatever issues were arising so I learned quite quickly that I had to um start filling my leadership toolbox a little bit because I'd have to maneuver through some kind of really dodgy situations to help advocate for my loved ones and do it in a way that 
uh, we'd have a positive outcome as best we could. Um, I think when we, you know, the question about barriers, um, you know, I spent the majority of my career working with the nurses of British Columbia and across Canada and uh, really kind of immersed myself in the profession. And my mom was a nurse too. And, and she was saying, you know, I kind of gradually kind of moved up the nursing ladder and eventually became elected as the president of all of the nurses and nurse practitioners in British Columbia. And it, with that came so much um, responsibility and the experience that I had was really extremely quite negative, but kind of debriefing and talking with my mom about things. Um, she's just like, uh, it doesn't matter how much you do out there. What really matters is what you do at home. And she was always really encouraged me to get back home, really connect with the people. And if, if the work I'm doing wherever I am not is not connecting back to the people, um, you have to reevaluate. So she kind of tough loved me in that situation and really um, pushed me in that area where uh, I made sure all of my practice was on reserve. And I, it's really good to see Chief Slat here. Uh, my first nursing job was in Bella Bella. My first nurse practitioner job was in Bella Bella. It's a really special place in my heart. Um, a, a lot of stories from that community and your nation. And uh, I think when it comes to talking about, thinking about and just reflecting on barriers that I've experienced in the political arena and in my practice, you know, first and foremost, the self, others with their kind of beliefs, assumptions, et cetera, um, policies, legislation, systems um, are set up. And you've heard about it throughout the morning around the colonial systems that uh, opp continue to oppress us. And um, I think for me in reflecting and kind of thinking about this moment and being able to share the most important thing for me is um, how difficult this 18 years has been and how much impact it's had on my health and my mental health and my mental wellness. And uh, I know Lauren talked a little bit about that army crawl and um, re really looking at what are we doing for ourselves in that balance because the needs and the critical incidences and the critical situations that our communities exist in and survive in and have to survive and have to face on a day-to-day -day basis, we end up taking the, uh, the brunt of that weight and on our shoulders in trying to help. We're just kind of throwing everyone on our backs and trying to maneuver it and move through the, the community's issues or the family's issues or the individual's issues. And to do that, like nursing is a profession that's 24 seven and uh, we, we literally are 24 seven around the clock, the health system has a core foundational health human resources of nurses that are there around the clock. And um, if we don't find that balance and find that place to rest and find that uh, opportunity to really kind of maintain um, our, your mental wellness or physical wellness, it gets really dangerous for us in this environment because um, of the acuity of the situations we have to deal with. And I got really sick. I, you know, I, it was working in my own home community in an eMERGE department. Uh, we had a deceased individual come in just completely um, a mess and having to witness that and deal with that and work with that. It, it just, you know, it, I've never been the same again, but having to find ways to um, be able to do your job, but be able to be safe and be able to be healthy and um, have support systems around you is really important. Um, those things aren't... Um, built into the system for us as Indigenous nurses or Indigenous health professionals. So that, that's a huge barrier um, to, and the HR kind of system for hospitals and health authorities don't have that Indigenous lens. So they, they're not um, kind of built in a way to help protect us as well. So having to advocate and fight for that and keep an eye out on myself because they're so busy worrying about everything else. Um, I started to get like under underwater quite a bit. So I had to pull back. I haven't practiced for the last probably two years now, really just kind of immersed myself in uh, the political um, advocacy point, points for nursing, Indigenous nursing. Um, also barriers for others is our own, our own Indigenous nurses. You know, I was back East actually a few weeks ago and was meeting with some nurse leadership out there and they, they were telling me this was way back when and um, you know one of the we we're trying to gather as many Indigenous nurses as we could and they're like well this this Indigenous nurse told me if I 
was friends with you on Facebook, they were going to delete me and they didn't want to have anything to do with me. But it, it was just that kind of jealousy, silly stuff that happens amongst ourselves. And um, also really kind of hoarding space and kind of really protective because we have to fight so hard for space that we don't realize we're not letting anybody in. Um, those are all self-inflicted barriers. Um, also really just looking at, uh, I think it was Leslie talked about that infiltrate, 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 really kind of getting into systems and getting into space and kind of elbowing your way in and uh, I've done that quite a lot in both with the union in British Columbia and the association in British Columbia for nurses and realize that, yeah, once I'm in there, it doesn't mean I'm in and that it's safe. It, it, uh, we created allocated seats and positions for indigenous nurses within these leadership roles. And we just set them up with bullseyes on their back. There was no kind of ways of setting up for protection. There was no ways of uh, shifting their kind of policies and mindset to actually utilize that indigenous nurse as a resource, as an expert, as somebody who can contribute to the shift and changes that were overall needed. And we ended up spending, and I know when I was in a leadership role within the nurses of the province, it was 90% uh, of my time was covering my jugular, dodging, jockeying, and just trying to move out of the way and not get hurt or not get hit or not get caught. And all that time I could have been working for the people, for all of British Columbians around, um, around you know, the shift that's required. So those barriers um, with others is also really huge. I think it's important to know, I think even I'm on the First Nations Health Council, uh, which is the advocacy governance arm for the First Nations Health Authority. When I first joined it, it was four years ago now, and I was really excited to be able to uh, infiltrate and realizing looking around and, you know, those, those 15 seats, there was no health professionals. There was no actual health professionals on that advocacy table or in that space, but they were people who had been you know, around the Indian politic block a number of times, but that doesn't help when we're trying to transform a system and just really being aware of who, what space we do have, who's in that space is really, really important because if we have the wrong people at the table who are gonna be better somewhere else, we're setting ourselves up for failure or we're gonna make that marathon we're in like twice as long or 10 times as long. Um, also a big barrier for, you know, just, you know, of course I'm biased for nurses, in the system overall, um, you know, we are the bulk of health human resources. We are the ones, we are often, if not always the first point of contact and we are often, if not all the time, the last point of contact when patients are discharged. And we're so underutilized as a, the system set up to, and this is my apologies to the physicians on, on the panel and, 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 and in the group that, uh, it's all about physicians, physicians, physicians for the most part, and really having to fight for the voice of nurses to be able to uh, be at those tables of deci those decision making tables. And we have so much to offer and so much to bring um, in terms of trans transformational change that's required in the overall system. I think, in all fairness, with the numbers and the amount of hours and um, the, just the we're, we're the bulk of it, we are we are the system as nurses. And if your nurses aren't on board and your, your nurses aren't kind of driving this agenda and, and driving this kind of dialogue, um, it's gonna be a really, really difficult uh, agenda to boulder to push up the mountain. So, and yeah, I think that's about it. I know we're really late for time and I have so much to say around this. I just, I just wanted to share my own personal, quickly share my own personal stories. I know, um, that the barriers are, I loved what you said, Dr. Shannon, about the, I don't know, artificial barriers perceived. It's so true. Like, let's just kind of get that out of the way and what are we doing here? And I think when I think about, I was trying to think about what, what, what is it that makes it things successful or when we reflect on it, is it working? What's working? And I think it just comes down to now that I'm kind of older and a junior elder and I've been around the block and it's just, am I grounded? Am I rested? Am I happy? Am I feeling the passion about this meeting that I'm going to? Is this something that I'm just driven for? Um, or am I just like, is this a chore? <laughs> like, it's just checking in and really, really understanding where we're at. And, and if, if I'm feeling dragged down and uh, exhausted and tired and no wind in my sails, is it because of the system or the wear down or I'm not balanced? Or is it something I'm not passionate about? 
there's so much work out there for us as Indigenous women um, that pick something that you love and just do what you love and what, what is your passion? Because that's where we need you the most. So that's what pulls the best out in us. And um, not get caught up in being a cog in a wheel and just trying to do something that's going to take your time up. Like life's too short. And I'm realizing that we just have to really do what we love. And that's where we're going to actually uh, influence some change. And also just looking back at the colonial processes that took away the roles of women in our culture and our traditions. Um, I'm just reflecting on watching, you know, my, I call him my grand nephew. He's my great nephew, uh, Casalas. He's a little guy. He's four now. And, you know, his ceremony of uh, rites of passage, and he's got these men caretakers. They, they, their, their job is to uplift and bring this child up and make sure. And so my nephew, Matt's a big part of that. And we really nurture that relationship for the men and their language learning and their singing and what are we doing in our own day-to-day -day lives? And that makes me question around that reclaiming and rebuilding of our traditional ways of being and the rules of women, because we really focus on our men a lot. And I just, um, I just have to challenge myself to keep reflecting on that and keep um, not only challenging myself individually to reclaim my language and roles within the, our traditional systems, um, but to, to role model it in our day-to-day -day lives like we do for our men. So I'll stop there. Uh, I just um, so feel so privileged and honored to be with this group. And I, I, hope, um, I hope we can continue to find ways to find each other and continue this conversation and really, really um, build off of each other because so many of all of you inspire me so much. Gaila Kisla, thank you. The end. Thank you, Danielle. And we're also uh, so honored to have you here on, on this panel, but also School of Nursing, honored to have you as a colleague. It's great, great to hear your personal reflections. That's why these panels are wonderful. We have historical, personal, you know, it's just, it's, it's a great um, rounding out of views. So we'll end with Chief Slet. Please go ahead. Great, thank you. Um, I have a slide presentation, so I'll ask uh, Shannon to, to put that up, if she can. Great. So I just want to, you know, acknowledge uh, the elders that have been guiding us throughout this call, the Zoom uh, presentation, and thank uh, Mary Allen for, and everybody that she works with for uh, reaching out, and I'm really honored to be a part of this. Uh, Zoom presentation, and I just want to, you know, uplift all of the speakers before me and those on on the panel that we're dealing with today. It's been uh, a, a really incredible and uplifting and uh, powerful morning. So, um, next slide, thank you. My name is uh, Kawazit uh, Marilyn Slett, and I'm a citizen of the Helsic Nation. And I was uh, appointed to the Board of uh, Directors for Vancouver Coastal Health in 2020. And I um, focus, uh, a lot of my focus is on rural health and Indigenous access as a, as a board member. Um, healthcare in rural communities is different than, than urban um, centers, so I tend to focus on, on that. And, um, you know, we have a lot of um, uh, rural communities on the central coast, so, you know, even, you know, just, you know, seeing a doctor, you know, um, is, is a challenge in, in our community. Uh, continuity is one of the biggest barriers that we have. You know, we have locums that come in and, you know, we're often retelling um, what, you know, is um, alien us and that does really prevent people from going back uh, to see the doctor because it's, you know, this continuous cycle. Um, I also work with uh, different First Nation leaders, um, you know, colleagues in, in the province. Uh, we've done different things together with you know, um, filing, you know, human rights uh, complaints around access to information around the uh, proximity of COVID cases in, in and around our communities and, uh, you know, negotiated an agreement with um, the PHO around uh, access to that information. And we've also been working on 
um, health governance, you know, as a, as a region as well. Next slide. So, you know, definitely, um, you know, supporting Indigenous women in health and healthcare leadership. I always, you know, look around at what tools do we have around us, you know, the, and, and I heard so much, so much of that here today in, in our presentations. But one of the tools that I, I look to in, in my community is our women's declaration. And this was written by women in our community through some focus groups. And uh, it was adopted by our elected council a few years ago. Um, it starts off with, we are Helsinki women and we are strong as cedar trees. And two of the articles in that declaration is we have the right to health and wellness and a responsibility to ensure the health and wellness of our children and our families. This is the principle of reciprocity. We have the right to safety. We deserve lives that are free of emotional, verbal, and physical and sexual abuse. This is the principle of respect. And it was really key in bringing forward to our, our joint leadership, and that's our traditional chiefs and our elected chiefs, uh, a resolution to support um, you know, these articles in our declaration. And we resolve to address sexual violence as a priority issue. All measures, strategies, and resources are going to be committed to addressing the impacts of sexual violence in our community. The Helsinki community deserves safety. We commit to breaking the cycle of sexual, sexual abuse and assault in our community. We commit to a trauma-informed and victim survivor centered, centered community approach. We do not condone sexual abuse and we acknowledge the root cause of sexual violence is intergenerational trauma caused by colonization. So I just wanted to share a bit of that because the resources and what we have in our community is what you know we need to be able to, to bring forward to be able to bring these issues you know forward in, in a really strategic and pragmatic way. Um, next slide. So you know women are natural collaborators and we work hard to strengthen and heal and restore the balance of our communities often before you know making sure that we're balanced, you know, ourselves. And, and you know, I, I heard that, you know, definitely within our presentations here today and really want to, you know, uh, share and express that it's so important for us to be able to take that time to create some space for, you know, being grounded in who we are and grounded in the work that we're doing. And I know that it's, it's really hard. You know, I... Um, been a chief counselor for my community for going on 14 years and uh, the executive director for five and an elected counselor for four before that. And we're hardest on ourselves as Indigenous people and communities, but the work that we do collaboratively, we can move mountains, we can, you know, do incredible things together. Um, but we always need to take care of ourselves as well. So I just wanted to share that. So our toolbox um, is something that I always look to when I'm uh, setting out to do some work in, in the community. And, you know, those include referring to mandate letters, you know, the articles of UNDRIP, uh, the Plain Sight Report, and our own laws and declarations, what I, you know, shared with you um, in that previous slide. Those, you know, declarations and our our own laws are the most powerful and they will have the solutions and the resolutions for community health care. Next slide. Barriers. Um, our elected council is uh, a council of 12 and we have uh, nine women councillors on our, uh, that have been elected to, to um, serve our community. And, you know, so definitely barriers have been uh, no seat at the table, uh, you know, and that is really, you know, 
we see have seen that in the community. Um, you know, our community has been quite progressive in in electing um, uh, you know females to to leadership positions, and they're they're all you know incredible women. Uh, some are community um, community advocates. Uh, others are you know have specialized in mental health. Others are lawyers, midwives. Um, yeah, it's it's an incredible group of women in our community. Uh, barriers also include, you know, decisions that are made without our input, uh, made about us without us, and you know, and and certainly, you know, the lack of cultural awareness. Um, I'll just really just talk about one, uh, you know, thing around lack of inclusion. Uh, we have a local hospital in our community, and uh, we were advised a few years ago that you know, to improve healthcare in our community, they were going to. Um, you know, terminate and phase out the patient care rates in our hospital, which were essentially the healthy people that worked in our hospital. And they said that they were going to, you know, bring in um, other positions into the hospital and there would be people coming in, you know, um, externally to fill those. And we met with uh, Vancouver Coastal Health and, and the leadership down at the local hospital and to no avail. You know, it wasn't, we weren't being heard. You know, we, we said that we couldn't do this. Um, you know, the patient carriers are the people that know our community. They're the ones there that know our people that are going in and provide that comfort and that care to, to people. And it wasn't until, you know, I, I looked at that toolbox and I said to my um, colleagues, well, you know, we, we need to write them a letter and uh, we need to let them know that we're going to file a human rights complaint. We have the right to uh, cultural um, care in our community. And we also need to let them know that we're gonna start reviewing all of the land leases that we have with Vancouver Coastal Health. You know, we, um, you know, this is something that, um, you know, is, is important and uh, we'll, we'll move that forward. I had no acknowledgement to that letter. Um, other than coming back saying good news, you know, um, you know, where uh, the patient carries are, are, you know, we're not moving forward with that, you know, restructure. And there was nothing again after that. So the lack of inclusion, you know, with our communities is, you know, um, one of the, the largest barriers that we have for healthcare. Next slide. So for success um, and conditions for success, we have a, uh, a constitution that we're just um, uh, finishing in, in our community and we've, uh, we're reclaiming the roles of women in our constitution. And we have an advisory uh, council as part of it and it's called the Munayuk's Council and that's uh, translated to sisters. And you know the uh, Munayuk's, our, our women um, matriarchs in our community that you know bring balance to our community and really are the backbone of our community and you know maintain that social fabric within our community. So you know our physical and mental health is you know connected with a healthy land and sea as well. And you know they're connected, and, and you heard this in Lauren's presentation to our, our ancestral names, to our cultural practice, to our village names, in everything that we do, and that also relates to you know the women in our community. Um, our matriarchs are called Umaks, um, and you you see them in this beautiful photo here, um, and yeah, they they bring wisdom, love. And, and so much uh, power, um, personal power to, to the work that we do. Next slide. Calls to action. So, so certainly this one is a TRC call to action. Um, you know, we call upon those that can affect change within the Canadian healthcare system to recognize the value of Aboriginal healing practices and use them in the treatment of Aboriginal patients in collaboration with Aboriginal healers and elders where requested by Aboriginal patients. But another call to action I wanted to um, bring forward um, 
to you know to to this panel and and to this uh, session is we need to you know certainly make sure that the resources are there to do the work that we need to do and you know so many times you know we come out with uh you know reports you know different evaluations different programs different things but there's no resources to to accompany it so, you know, we definitely need to make sure that there are adequate resources to, to do the work um, that has been identified here, both human and financial. And we need to, you know, ensure that Indigenous health is um, reclaimed and that we're deconstructing the colonial impacts, you know, on our communities, um, you know, in terms of healthcare in our communities. So that is a call to action that I wanted to put forward. While I've been on this call today, I received a message from from my office saying that they're just going into a um, an emergency uh, meeting of our interagency of our healthcare workers in the community. In the last ten days, we've had fourteen suicide attempts by by young people in our community. And you know, our communities. I know we're not you know isolated in this. Our communities, you know. We're, we're reeling with, you know, the, the impacts of, you know, colonial impacts to lack of resources, to lack of access to, you know, the after effects of, you know, this pandemic that we've been, you know, living through. So I really do uphold, you know, all of the incredible women, you know, that are working on the front lines, you know, of healthcare and, and just let you know that you have my love and support and, you know, I know that we have, you know, an incredible amount of work to do both at home and, and you know, in the larger roles that we have. Diaxica to all of you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chief Slut. I'm so sorry to hear that news coming through. And mm -hmm. unfortunately, it, there's a reality across, again, both sides of the border. The suicide rates are off the charts in many cases, and, and it's often the young people that have the highest numbers. So we're, we're all with you on Thank you. care for that. Thank you so much. And thank you to the panel. I know that we are over, so I'm going to give it over to Mary Ellen and let her <laughs> decide where we go from here. <laughs> yes, thank you. And um, thank you to the panelists as well. We, we are over. I wanted to just um, say that we do have a rapporteur for today. Harmony Johnson is assisting us at the Residential School History and Dialogue Centre. So we are going to be preparing a follow-up report. So where we've had questions and themes that obviously we've had so much rich discussion and just that final um, you know, comment about the need to build out supports and community and the demands on all of the the leaders that have participated today are enormous. And I just really wanna express my gratitude but we will have um, a chance to, in the dialogue report, we'll make sure, particularly amongst panelists and others, there's a chance to review it. Um, I do understand that with the late time, I am going to have to wrap up here and um, again, express gratitude. I do want to recognize and thank, of course, everyone who participated to make this effective and all of the people working behind the scenes, including the staff at the Residential School History and Dialogue Center. UBC Learning Circle, the Center for Excellence in Indigenous Health, and the First Nations House of Learning. And I want to say thank you to uh, the audience for hanging in with us during the webinar. Really appreciate it. I'd um, also like to thank the financial support from First Nations Health Authority and the UBC Anti-Racism Fund for the event. Um, we've had some very triggering um, content and we've had some very frank and full discussions. Just uh, important to remind people that there are resources to come to. Um, and But also I wanna call upon um, our elders, uh, Doris and Roberta, to close um, our event for us. It's, I think it's important to ground ourselves as we go forward in the rest of our day and interact with our families and our colleagues and our friends and just to center and maintain our personal wellness. So I want to um, ask the elders to close for us and uh, then we will officially end. And as I say, there will be a recording available as well. So welcoming back um, Elder Roberta and Elder, Dor Elder uh, Doris Fox, thank you so much for giving us a closing.
Thank you so much, Mary Ellen, and to everyone, to all the panelists, the host, all who stayed right till the very end to hear these magical, incredible, strong, powerful women speak today. Um, it's been an honor, again, to be able to be a witness to these amazing women and to hear their words. And now that we have our foot in the door, we need to kick it open with our other foot, as my sister used to say. Kick it open with the other foot. Now we have the network to, us, we say, lift up each other, to, to hold you up when you're feeling sad or down or um, having troubles getting through your day. Reach out and ask one of the beautiful people that were here today, hold me up, lift me up, sa'ast. Remember that, sa'ast. Lift up means to lift up spiritually, not just to, to grab somebody and hold them up. Um, we were taught how to be ugly to each other in residential school, in society, etc. But every single one of these amazing people that have been here today are changing that, have started making that change. We raise our hands in gratitude from my family and from my home community, Omaskoyan. We raise our hands in gratitude for you coming today, for sharing your wisdom, your magic, your spirit, your heart. We thank you. We thank you. We thank you so humbly and gratefully. You honor us. You honor us. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you to anyone who had anything to do with bringing this beautiful uh, session together, this imaginary uh, virtual circle. As my dear sister, Elder Roberta said, we can imagine and pretend we are in circle. And that is a sacred place to be. That's how I was taught. Circles are sacred. So thanks everybody. May great spirit continue to protect you to give you the rest, the quiet that you need to continue to wake up each morning and be courageous and strong, to be able to face the day and continue pushing forward for yourself, for your family, for your community, and for all Indigenous people. Thank you so much, my dear sister. My dear sister, elder Dr. Roberta Jose, now she has a title worthy of her. <laughs> I pass it over to you. Thank you so much to my dearest, dear sister, elder Doris, holding my hands up in honor and thanks to each and every one of you. Before I say a blessing, I want to say that, you know, in sitting in, being involved with my children's school, like they're now in their close to 50. Uh, so more than 40 years of sitting at those tables to say, you know, we need to see ourselves reflected. We need to see ourselves reflected in front of the classroom if that's what we want to do. Driving the bus if that's what we want to do. Sweeping the floor if that's what we want to do. Serving the lunch in the cafeteria if that's what we want to do. I've been saying that for 40 years. And now I feel lovely, lovely women leaders. Us, as Elder Doris says, we see ourselves reflected in so many, many places now. And there's many, many of us working on the front lines, doing our little, working as hard as we can, doing our little spot. And in another uh, event, I said, you know, we're doing it here. I was in a, in, in a national conference. I said, we're doing it here and here and here and here. Right across Turtle Island, you know what? All of us doing our, our little bit or big bit, it's always a big bit when it comes to grandmas, moms, daughters, granddaughters, great granddaughters. If when we join hands right across Turtle Island, guess what? They can't keep us down. So I hold my hands up in honor and thanks to each and every one of you today. My heart is so full. The, I can't believe it's the end of 2021 almost. And my heart and spirit were just really kind of going down a bit because standing up on that front line, 
holding up the moms and babes, trying to keep them together as a, a mother baby dyad, family dyad, really, really hurts the heart when MCFD keeping their, their colonial led policy in place to separate the families. So each listening to each and every one of you, all the good works that you're doing have healed my heart and spirit just a little bit. So I can take a deep breath, stand up again, stand up again for our families, especially our moms and dads. So I'll share a blessing and a prayer. Margaret and Mary Ellen and Harmony and everybody, I can't even list the long list of all the people who came together to put this beautiful, beautiful event together. So I can't name it, but I thank you all. So OCM, I'll say, say a blessing and thank you, Elder Doris, for your beautiful words. OCM. Haichka, Haichka, OCM, OCM. We give you many, many thanks, Creator for bringing us all together in this very wide, wide virtual circle. Such a warm, respectful, loving and uplifting way. We kindly and respectfully ask you creator to continue to wrap each and every one of us and all of our loved ones in your warmest blanket of protection as we all continue on this journey together in our lives. Help us each to keep safe in our travels both near and far creator. We always give you many, many thanks, Creator, as we ask you to bring all of your blessings down upon all the ones that are hurting, all the ones that are grieving, all the ones that are hungry, all the ones without homes, and especially, Creator, all the ones that are hurting, all the ones that are grieving. Haichka, Haichka, OCM, OCM. Thank you so much, everyone. Just finishing OCM. off. Elder Doris always teaches, keep shining the light. And Leslie, always holding us up. Don't let anybody put out your light. Each and every one of you are such a bright, bright light to many, many people who need that light. So OCM, OCM, thank you. OCM.